Hello everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 223. This is the Patreon Dry Dock, that's why it's at the end of the month. There's approximately 80 questions to get through, so it'll probably be on the slightly higher end of things. So let's get stuck in with questions ASAP. Alec Ruby asks, Dr. Alexander Clark believes that the Congos in World War II did qualify as fast battleships because they did intend them to be escorts to the carriers. Do you believe that this is a reasonable argument? Um, well, as you know, I don't think the Congos are battleships. I still maintain they're battle cruisers. Although, I must admit, that did inspire, last time I spoke about this in detail, this, that did inspire a rather angry person to uh, start typing furiously in the comments who accused me, amongst other things, of trying to spread the British idea of what a battleship is. Okay, fair enough, if you insist. Um, and also the British idea of what a battle cruiser is. Um... I'm I'm pretty sure those are relatively common definitions. The ones I used, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of them being unique to the Royal Navy. Um, but nevertheless, uh, oh, uh, the, the other fun thing about that comment was when I mentioned that there are some World War Two sources that refer to the Congos as battle cruisers that are you know from uh, the Japanese side of things. Um, his response to that was, well, I haven't read any of the sources that Drac mentions, therefore I'm going to assume they don't exist. Which is like, yes, yeah, slow hand clap for uh, academic integrity there. Hey, Anyway, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that, yes, Japan did abolish the term battle cruiser officially back at the beginning of the 1930s. But you'll find an awful lot of Japanese officers um, <laughs> in World War II... And, as I said, occasionally, the uh, the occasional document will still refer to them as um, as battle cruisers, I, the Japanese word for battle cruisers, which incidentally also um, pops back up again towards the end of the war in respect of some of the larger cruisers that they're attempting to build or thinking of attempting to build. So it's a, it's a little bit of a more fluid term than perhaps strictly battle cruiser would be in English, but nevertheless, anyway, going on and responding to the <laughs> actual question, um, I don't think intending to use them to escort carriers qualifies them as fast battleships, because that's just a mission profile. You can use destroyers to escort carriers, you can use cruisers to escort carriers, um, you can use battle cruisers to escort carriers. I mean, Force H, HMS Renown and Ark Royal were quite the pair for a, a while, so, you know, that because Renown was escorting Ark Royal did not make her a battleship. And yes, you can use battleships to escort carriers, and if you're going to do that, they should probably be fast to keep up with them. But, you know, it's kind of like the uh, a Ferrari is red, my car is red, therefore my car is a Ferrari. That doesn't actually work. It's kind of, you know, a battleship must be fast to escort a carrier, um, this ship is escorting a carrier, therefore this ship is a fast battleship? Mm, no. To try and explain it a little bit more, I came up with this handy alignment chart. And yes, I know they can't, the sort of concept comes from a bit of uh, various memes and stuff, but I do think it's handy as a shorthand reference. So I've aligned them by doctrine and structure. So doctrine, purist, neutral, radical, structure, purist, neutral, radical, and well, little captions, fairly self-explanatory. Now, where I fall is that, essentially, I suppose, if you're looking at it through the lens of this chart, I fall on the grounds of, I will accept as a battleship something that hat ticks at least one of the purest boxes, and I'm prepared to stretch to a neutral box. So, Scharnhorst, for example, I would count as a battleship, because, you know, she's designed to fight and survive um, in a battle line or in an engagement against another capital ship, in her case, contemporaries Dunkirk and Strasbourg. And she has, you know, heavy armour. OK, the guns aren't particularly big for a battleship, so that's the structural neutral. So, Doctrine Pure, structural neutral, she's a battleship. Um, in the Hood and Iowa, whether they're fast battleships or battle cruisers. Again, you can see where I've placed Hood. She has guns and is protected against them uh, in terms of her belt armour and the 15-inch guns. 
and the doctrine that she's used under, she's not designed to fight straight up in a battle line, but she is designed to be capable of engaging an enemy capital ship, whether that be battle cruiser or battleship, with her guns if necessary. So she's a structural purist because of that 12-inch inclined armor, but doctrine neutral, so I'll accept her, and obviously Yamato is a battleship because it's doctrine and structure pure. And you can see where I've put Congo. She's in the doctrine neutral, structure neutral, because doctrine neutral, yep, she is capable of engaging an enemy capital ship with her guns, but she's not designed to stand and fight in the battle line. Um, her role you know, is the pretty much the classic battle cruiser role of hunting smaller enemy vessels, maybe fighting the enemy, odd enemy battle cruiser, and maybe supporting the battle line later on in an engagement, but she's not a front and centre battle line unit. And then, you know, structure-wise, she's got the big guns, but she doesn't have the heavy armour to resist her own guns, so she's not structure pure, she's structure neutral, and therefore she falls under basically the tr true neutral of the battleship alignment chart, but that falls one step out of where I personally would accept a ship to be a battleship, fast or otherwise. Now, I accept some people might disagree, but, you know, that's my opinion, <laughs> and I don't see any particular significant reason to change it, because I think my opinion's grounded in some degree of objective reality. Obviously, feel free to disagree in the comments if you like, um, but do be aware if you turn around and say, yes, well, you mentioned this source track, but I've not seen it, so therefore I'm going to choose to believe it doesn't exist at all. I'm probably not going to pay a great amount of credence to your, anything else you might say. <laughs> Jellico Cats Get Confused at Night asks, Among the many travails visited on the crew of the Irish Rover in its song was measles. I know Roald Dahl lost his daughter to a case of measles encephalitis in 1962. Just how dangerous were what we would consider childhood diseases to the undernourished crews of an age of sail ship? Could something like measles or chickenpox take out large portions of the crew? Well, I think the first thing to clear up here is that most Age of Sail warship crews were not actually undernourished. They were expending a huge amount of energy while they were sailing and fighting their ships. And the amount of calories in their diet, as issued in their rations, was actually quite high. Now, you could obviously have problems if either the purser or somebody ashore was being corrupt and the quality of the food wasn't um quite so good or if you ended up at sea for considerably longer than you expected and you began to run low but in normal circumstances assuming you got moderately corrupt onshore supply officials and you were at least being resupplied on something approximating the schedule that you were supposed to and or were able to call into various ports then at least once they'd hit scurvy over the head then you you definitely weren't going to be undernourished. However, there's two sides to this um, in the broader thing of you know childhood diseases. Pre working out how to cure scurvy, crews were very vulnerable to diseases that got onto the ship. Now this kind of works either side of uh, dealing with scurvy, but pre dealing with scurvy obviously you'd have a weakened immune system which would make the whole thing a lot worse on top of anything now the general point being that when it comes to ships on the one hand an age of sail ship once it is out at sea is actually relatively immune to waves of disease that are sweeping across the land simply because they will be out there for weeks months possibly years not really coming into contact with their homeland and if they come across a port that has an outbreak of disease, they usually, unless they're in desperate straits, can just go to another one without coming into direct contact with people. And the flip side is obviously ports were very, uh, usually very careful about not allowing ships that had an outbreak of some disease aboard them to dock. So once you're aboard a few weeks out and no one's come down with something horrific, you're actually probably going to be fine. The flip side to that is, of course, that if someone does come aboard with something really nasty or picks it up on shore leave or whatever, then you're in a very cramped, humid environment with a bunch of other people you're coming into a lot of close contact with. 
at which point the conditions for spreading disease are quite you know favorable for the, whatever the disease is obviously as mentioned you know if you don't have a weakened immune system due to scurvy and you've got something approximating what you're supposed to have as a diet on an age of sail warship you're probably overall going to have a relatively decent immune system so you know these kinds of diseases spreading through the slums of various major cities at the time would be far more lethal because they're in pretty much the same conditions but with a lot worse diet therefore a lesser immune system but you know if something was virulent enough to start spreading then yeah you would really be in trouble at that point now exactly what kind of effect it could have on you you know something like uh chicken pox or measles it could be pretty much as we experience it as kids these days in the western world i.e annoying debilitating but you could get over it on the other hand it could be fatal i mean measles comes in all sorts of different levels of severities some of which are very capable of killing and of course it's compounded by the fact that if you have these childhood diseases nowadays and you get them somewhat badly there's a whole suite of medical care available to try and help you whereas yeah if you're on board ship and there's a, a serious measles outbreak the best you can hope for is being tucked up with some blankets in a hammock and hope you don't die <laughs> which may not be the world's highest chance hope at that point mssb asks is there any website like combined fleet or other resources that would show the deployment of various allied ships in and around july 1939 i'm not aware of any single site that aggregates all of that together in one place if you obviously you've got combined fleet as you mentioned which covers a lot of the japanese stuff if you go to naval-history.net um, you can find a lot of information about where the British and Commonwealth navies were, albeit it's, as far as I can find on the site, it's not in a map. Um, but it will tell you, like, this formation was here, this formation was here, breaks down all the fleets, and then you can either work out by specific ships or by looking up the formations exactly what those compositions were. But, yeah, I, I think if you were going to try and work out where every single potential allied ships so french british american russian etc etc were in july 1939 you would have to aggregate various sites like naval history.net um and plot it all out yourself uh, because well even in and around july 1939 ships would be on the move and you know at the first part of July they might be in one place, in the second half of July they might be in somewhere completely different. And yeah, I, I don't think anybody's actually tracked everything <laughs> um, for uh, that number of ships. It'd be an interesting project if someone did, but it, I suspect it would be a project of a lifetime. Rebel Skvirl asks, What goes into the design and construction of a ship's propellers? You've said in the past that this was an issue with regards to the vibration problems on the North Carolina class. How can design work and testing avoid this sort of problem? So the issue with the North Carolina class was partly the propellers, partly it was just the overall uh, hull construction. So as I mentioned on previous dry docks, when they built the North Carolinas, because of basically the treaty restrictions, they had to run the outer propellers quite far away from the hull and they decided well let's put them in some giant skegs which are effectively for they i suppose if they were in aircraft you call them fairings and the idea of that was partly to protect the shafts a bit to provide a bit of extra anti-torpedo defense um and partly also just to um, support the shafts because they were outside of the ship for quite a long distance Unfortunately, this created a kind of underwater tunnel, which then the harmonics of the propellers turning within that tunnel, particularly the uh, two inboard propellers, created resonance at certain speeds, which caused all the problems that they had. So part of that was caused by the props, and a part of the way they solved the problem was to change those propellers around by you know, having 
different sizes of blades and different numbers of blades and so on and so forth. And eventually, although they never fully solved the issue, they managed to shift the issue to a speed where the ship was very rarely ever going to go at, um, i.e. it was about 17, 18 knots, I think. So the ship would normally cruise at 12 to 15 knots or it would be going 20 plus knots and there'd be a bit of vibration while it transitioned through the upper teens, but they didn't spend a lot of time at the upper teen speed, which was fairly good. Now, the problem there was that you could design a perfectly good propeller, but unless you tested it on a rig that also simulated all of the hydrodynamic conditions of the underwater hull of the ship you were going to be using it on, you were going to miss something like the way it interacted with the tunnel created by the skegs. And that's assuming you even realised that that was a thing that could happen at the time. And then, thanks to the wonders of how things scale, it may not even show up if you actually run scale model tests. Because different things, when it comes to model testing, work and other things don't because, as I said, things scale differently depending on what exactly it is you're testing. So if you take a scale model of a ship and you put it through a tank, you can measure its friction coefficient and uh, friction coefficient and various other numbers, your Froude number and so forth, and that can help you refine the hull. But if you build a ship to precise scale out of exactly the materials you're going to use... It won't work because the you know, because of the square cube law. If you make a ship out of steel that is, I don't know, um, you know, let's say the ship is made out of steel and it's a one to sixteenth scale. It's a fairly large ship, um, but if it's largely made out of steel, you're going to re re reach a point where you can't make it any thinner. Um, because otherwise you'll be making out tinfoil. And therefore, with the significant reduction in volume, it's probably going to end up sitting deeper in the water or, and or sink, which is why a lot of the tank test ships are made out of wood, which also lends itself a bit more easily to reshaping it if you want to change the whole form, but nonetheless. And resonance is another one of those things that sometimes scales in underwater testing and other times doesn't um, so it's not entirely clear given the technology they had at the time in the mid 1930s whether scaling up tests done on like a 1 to 24th or 1 16th scale version of the aft section of a North Carolina class ship's hull would have even detected that the resonance was present firstly and secondly if it was an issue because, of course, if you're using, a, again, a scale model vessel, it's probably going to be proportionally, structurally a lot stronger. And just, you know, even if you're even if you are using the same materials, even if you do make a steel one um, and support it in some manner, the simple fact is that when you get resonance and vibration and everything, the length of the material, uh, and therefore the amount it can flex, has a huge effect on tests. So if you've got a scale model of a North Carolina stern that's say a foot long even if you're generating resonance at scale the chances are your model is not going to be moving all that much because the energy that's being created by that resonance would have to cause you know a foot long box girder of steel effectively to bend which is very very unlikely given the energies that are being generated versus the material qualities of the model Whereas, you know, you scale that up to a ship that's several hundred feet long and suddenly it is much, much more possible. So nowadays, obviously, they can do computer digital testing to pick, try and pick these kinds of things up. But when it comes to the time period, you can do design testing to determine if your propellers in and of themselves are going to cause a problem with cavitation or thrust coefficients or um, if they're unbalanced or whatever but something as complex as the issues faced by the North Carolina class I don't think that you're going to be able to realistically find 
calculate and avoid using mid-1930s scale tests. Vokir asks, when did the use it or lose it approach to US Department of Defense funding come about, and how has it impacted the US Navy? I'm not entirely sure, to be perfectly honest. Uh, Most of the time when I'm working on US Navy budgetary estimates, etc., for the time period the channel covers, you know, they're asking for X amount of money for Y programs several years in advance. Uh, Obviously, the agreements are usually much, much closer to the time period, sometimes even into the year in question. Um, That's the financial year, not the calendar year. But in terms of any surplus, you know, sometimes it's reallocated to other programs because ultimately with something as complex as a Navy, some programs might be under budget um, and a number will definitely be over. But um, yeah, in terms of a specific, you have asked for X million dollars or you know, billion dollars these days, I suppose. And if you don't use every single cent of it, you have to give it back and then we won't give you more or the same next year. I don't know if dash when such a policy was introduced to Department of Defense spending. Maybe someone else who does a bit more work in financial analysis, etc., or the bureaucratic side of the Navy can let us know in the comments. Um, But I do know what that looks like because... As a number of you may know, I worked in, amongst other things, local authorities in the UK um, previously, and local authorities in the UK very definitely have a use it or lose it um, approach put in place by the government in terms of the government money that is given to them. And for those of you who are unaware, as the term suggests, it's basically a case of you ask the government for X amount of money, they may or may not give you that money, um, but if they do, so let's say you're a council and you ask for $50 million in central government funding for that year, then if you come back and say, well, you know, we we asked you for 50 and we got 50 but we only used 45 then the government won't let you keep the other five. They'll take it back. And next year, if you come and say, well, we would like another 50 the government will turn around to you and say, well, actually, you know, last year... You asked for 50, you only used 45, so this year we're only prepared to give you 45. And it takes a huge amount of trouble to try and persuade them otherwise. This is what leads, for those of you in the UK who haven't figured this out yet, this is why round about February, March time, you suddenly see an awful lot of weird and wonderful things being paid for by local councils, or at least you used to. These days, they pretty much are all out of money around Christmas anyway. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, it was always very bizarre that, you know, obviously potholes and stuff would have to be repaired as winter came to a close, but you'd see all sorts of fancy curb regeneration works and little beautifying projects and all sorts of random things where you look at it and go, I'm pretty sure that's not necessary. Also, why are you doing this en masse in, you know, early spring for no reason whatsoever when a lot of this might have been useful at other times of the year? And it was basically because departments were looking at their budgets and going, we've got to spend it on something. And if we don't spend it on something very quickly, we're not going to have that money next year when we might need it. Um, (laughs) So... (laughs) Yeah, it, it, it's not, to be perfectly honest, the world's best approach for budgeting things and managing your finances. But as with any politically run organisation, very few things ever do make sense. Brad asks, follow up question to one a few months ago about education and training support of the enlisted in the Royal Navy. One of the guys on the officers mess on discord was talking about how many ncos have graduate degrees was the change in technology such as from coal to oil a big motivator to this support and was or was this always around in some form or was it dependent on your ship i think most of that sits outside of the period the channel covers because as far as i'm aware it is pretty much down to changes in technology because if you think about what an NCO or a senior NCO might be doing today versus what they might be doing in the age of sail or in World War I, World War II. You know, your senior non-commissioned officers 
like say a ship's master or something like that back in say the age of sail they got their qualifications basically by just being at sea for long periods of their lives and they gained experience organically on the job um there were universities obviously in the age of sail but they didn't teach things like ships navigation and gunnery um, there might be courses within universities that might cover the ability to navigate at sea um, or navigate just generally using things like sextants but for a non-commissioned officer they wouldn't have the money to go there and they wouldn't have the desire to compromise their sea time either once you get into world war Two, especially and you start to see much more advanced technology come in in terms of things like radar electronics and electrics have kind of been gradually coming into the fleet even since the late 19th century but that's supposed you have the switch over from electrics to electronics has was certainly obviously accelerating during the second world war and at that point that sort of the end of the channel period is kind of when you would start to see a need for senior ncos to have some kind of degree because the engine technology especially once you get onto turbines and diesels is getting more complex especially once you get electronic controls for them as well um radar missiles all of this kind of thing it's moved a lot from you know you can pick this up as a rating or an or um an enlisted seaman or whatever on the job and gradually work your way up the ranks to you know you need a college or university education to even work out what the heck is going on <laughs> um so yeah my knowledge on that field is a, a little bit sparse to say because it's mostly post this channel's time period as far as i'm aware but you know take that as you will david stang jr asks how integrated was Coastal Command with the Royal Navy in hunting German U-boats? Well, Coastal Command was formed by the RAF after they lost control of the fleet air arm back to the Royal Navy. And so it was actually a very new service, and as well as not being particularly well liked by the RAF when war broke out. Now, the impression that I've got from, obviously mostly the naval side of things, is that Early on in the war, as well as being somewhat starved of resources and also poached by the RAF for pilots and aircrew, Coastal Command wasn't particularly well integrated with the Royal Navy at the start of the war. Certainly things like the Channel Dash show the general communication problems between the Royal Navy and the RAF as a whole, and the Royal Navy and Coastal Command in particular. But at the same time, you know, if you use the Channel Dash as a microcosm, there are also examples of Coastal Command aircraft actually working in conjunction with the Navy, at least in terms of established routines, if not necessarily, you know, rapid instant reaction and so forth. So, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. And, you know, given the timing of the Channel Dash, they had had a few years at that point to work out how they were going to try and operate together. So... As I said, my general impression is that it started out difficult, but gradually the integration with Coastal Command improved over time as the war went on, uh, to the extent that by the kind of mid-late war they were actually fairly well integrated, especially when it came to U-boat hunting and use of technologies. But it was there were still going to be some operational differences because of the flight plans, profiles, aircraft, technology, etc., 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 that the Royal Air Force favoured versus the Royal Navy. Greb asked, Does any ships carry and use both square rig sails and latine sails, switching them as needed, like a frigate, or did that require too many men? Plenty of ships carried and used both square and latin sails, as you can see here, particularly on the mizzen masts, although... You would also see them, depending on the time period of the ship, um, strung between masts as well. However, um, in terms of what I think you're asking, which is whether they carried a full set of latine and a full set of square rigged sails and switched 
between the two as needed. I'm not aware of any major ship classes or types that did that. Um, possibly some small Mediterranean craft might have tried something like that, I suppose. But in terms of you know the galleons, frigates, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth rates, etc., no, it would be, if you had them both, you might use them, but they would be independently rigged on their own masts. You wouldn't, say, take the, the yard arm and the yards of a latin a rig, like, say, on the mizzen mast of this ship, and then swing it around and suddenly it becomes a square sail because the rig type that you need to support a latin mast is entirely different from the one you need to support a square sail. And... Yeah, switching between the two would basically involve a dockyard job for the most part, unless you're jewellery rigging something. So maybe if you'd been in battle or a severe storm and everything had been completely smashed up, if you had, say, the yards of the lower... If you had the lower yards of your main mast and that was the only thing that was intact but the only sail that hadn't been blown out and ripped to shreds by the wind was a lateen sail, then with a fair bit of chopping and changing, you could probably rig a lateen sail on your main mast, but that would be a jury rig job that, again, would have to be put right in a dockyard. Eric J. Van Duting asks, I've read that on the morning of May 8th, 1942, during the Battle of Coral Sea, the Japanese judged the seas were too rough for float plane operations and therefore had to use torpedo bombers as scouts instead. Could you discuss how rough the seas need to get to prevent float plane operations if the issues are primarily with launching or recovery, or both, and how much having a larger, more stable ship can offset the weather? I'm not entirely too sure about the Coral Sea bit, because I have read other sources that suggest that the Japanese used a combination of float planes off of their cruisers plus bombers off of the carriers, largely because they didn't have um, either of the Tones with them, so they had a limited number of cruiser-based float planes, so for the size of the search that they wanted to conduct, you needed to supplement that. And the Japanese did have a policy of supplementing cruiser-based scouts, which were admittedly their primary, at least in doctrine, scout aircraft, with scout aircraft or bombers off of the carriers where necessary. So it wasn't exactly completely out of line for them. Nonetheless... Um, when it comes to float plane operations and rough seas, most of the issues tend to be with landing because most aircraft carrying ships that aren't carriers, in World War II at least, are usually using catapults to launch. Now, there are a few which are still using cranes to lower the aircraft over the side and then have it do a run-up to take off. And you know, in those cases, the rough seas will affect the launch as well. But generally speaking, if you have a catapult-launched float plane, which is most of the time the case, then the seas would have to be particularly rough to stop you running float plane ops, because you can just, you know, with, a, with your ship, you can just you know, fire them off. It doesn't take too much time to do that. However, you also have to take into account, will the seas be that way when these aircraft are coming back? And this is where maybe a sea state that wouldn't necessarily stop you launching them might st stop you from deciding to launch them, which is subtly different, because you might not think you'll get them back safely. And there are ways to mitigate that. So in extremists, you could put oil down in the water that mitigates waves somewhat a fairly common approach by ships to help their float planes land was to do a high speed turn ahead of the area where the float plane was going to land and use the ship itself uh, to create a sort of calm area for the float plane to land on so uh, so basically it comes down to most of the issues around float plane operation in world war ii and rough seas are to do with how rough the sea is going to be for recovery and is there anything the ship can do to counter that? And if so, you know how expensive is it going to be in terms of the rest of the formation's operational capability, if indeed there is a formation? And now, obviously, having a larger, more stable vessel will help. Will help if you've got a fairly fast, fairly narrow-beamed cruiser. Then perhaps being in a sea state uh, of a given value might 
make even a catapult launch a bit more risky as compared to a much broader beam, much more steady battleship. But if you're in a sea state where, you know, it's rough enough to threaten your catapult launch with being non-viable, it's definitely too rough for that aircraft to be recovered back again. So having a larger ship mostly just helped in terms of the size of the still area or calmer area you can create for your returning float plane. Although, of course, if you're in a much slower vessel, uh, you will be somewhat less able to do that as compared to a very fast ship so you know swings and roundabouts there lieutenant william bush asks i've seen a few references to the royal navy's destruction of the german supply ship network in the aftermath of the bismarck operation which forced planned atlantic raiding operations such as admiral shears to be cancelled but not many details. Can you elaborate on the size of the supply ship network and its destruction? It appears that even if Bismarck had been able to return to Germany and been repaired, its career as an Atlantic raider was probably over. So the German supply ship network had several different commands, but when it came to the Atlantic, they appear, at least at the time of uh, Bismarck's operation, to have had something in the region of two to three dozen vessels, under their command of which just over a dozen were at sea and nine of which were assigned to support Bismarck's operation and this was a mix of mostly tankers for refueling but also supply ships carrying you know food ammunition spare parts etc etc and they weren't just there to resupply Bismarck although I said nine of them were specifically tasked for that for Bismarck and Prince Eugen's planned mission these were also the supply ships that were supposed to um, resupply the Hilfskreuzer, which, remember, would be out for years at a time. And they were also to resupply U-boats where necessary. So the, the supply ships, if you like, the solid store ships would also be carrying torpedoes um, and mines and so forth. And it, it was all quite, quite an extensive and elaborate operation. The ships were mostly based out of the French Atlantic ports further south uh, along that coast. Occasionally they'd try and get one out from Germany etc but that was largely where there was a ship that would be useful for the purpose and had managed to get out before the war. Uh, obviously there was more of that activity in the early part of the war than later on and also interestingly pretty much all of the ships that were captured in the aftermath of Bismarck's operation all confirmed that they'd actually been operating out of Vichy French ports on the Western African coast. So, yeah, Vichy France not necessarily entirely neutral in this uh, conflict, but nonetheless, um, that's, what, that's where they were, that's what they were doing. So obviously a tanker could easily operate continually out of a French West African port, whereas a solid supply ship, okay, you could pick up food and so forth, uh, but if it needed German mines, torpedoes, shells, etc., etc., they'd, they'd have to pop into a southern Atlantic coast French port. Uh, obviously, you know, the in terms of the southernmost ones that the germans occupied um <laughs> because they weren't the germans weren't going to ship their latest and greatest torpedoes to vichy france and then have them load up that far south but anyway um so as you can tell from the numbers it's quite it was quite an extensive network but in the aftermath of bismarck's operation as you noted the royal navy made a specific point of hunting them down and most of the ones assigned to the bismarck operation were captured or sunk. Um, a number of others that were just operating generally in the Atlantic were also captured or sunk shortly thereafter. And on top of that, obviously, with the increasing numbers of escorts, increasing numbers of escort carriers, flying boats, long-range patrol aircraft, etc., etc., the safety of these surface-based supply vessels became less and less. And so, over the rest of 1941 and into 1942, a lot of them were taken out. Some of them were still around for quite considerable periods, but that tended to be partly a matter of luck and partly a matter of sailing to specific rendezvous and then heading back to safety again, as opposed to just hanging out generally, refueling and restocking multiple different ships, which is what they did in the early part of the war. 
and partly because of the increased effectiveness of allied raid uh, allied surface vessels raiding the german supply network this is kind of one of the driving reasons behind the creation of the so-called milku u-boats uh, which had pretty much the same role except they're less capable of doing so but obviously much less easy to detect by the allies so yeah with the concerted effort to take out a good chunk of the existing supply network it would have massively complicated any further german attempts to go out and do surface raiding and in particular um you know it, it, i mean it, yes it's kind of a cart before horse situation but even if the channel dash hadn't resulted in the two Shan horse running into so many mines the end result of bismarck's voyage was that even if you'd had both Shan horse and turpits and maybe uh hipper and prince eugen and a couple of the deutschland Scheer and lutzau around all in one place and all operational at once they're still very unlikely to have ever been sent back out into the Atlantic because there just wouldn't have been the supply network to maintain them all there. So, you know, if they kept Bismarck back and aimed for a larger force, then maybe at that point, with the supply network less compromised, at least from the logistics side of thing, it might have been viable. But once that, you know, that big effort was made in mid-1941, it would have been very difficult for the Germans to maintain any extensive or considerable presence at sea with surface raiding warships. Sworn brother of, ballist of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning asks, I've been wondering for a long time about deck gun mounts on submarines, specifically why you would mount the gun after the conning tower. The Germans, at least as far as I know, always put the gun forward, same with the British. The Japanese had some aft-mounted guns, but appear to have mostly done that on their aircraft-carrying subs because the catapult used up all the forward deck space. But the US Navy started putting the gun aft of the conning tower in the 1930s and then switched back and forth from one boat to the next for no apparent reason. What's the deal with that? So, ostensibly, at least as far as I can tell, the aft deck mount position, which you can see here on, a US, I think this is USS Marlin, was the default position for the US fleet subs on the basis that the gun was supposed to be for defensive purposes only, i.e. if you're going after a target, you were supposed to be using your torpedoes. If you're caught in shallow water or on the surface and you needed something to distract your opponent with whilst you were legging it for deep water and being able to dive, well, then having the deck gun aft was a good idea. But it was specifically stated that, you know, if you actually end up in a gunfight, 99% of the time the target's going to have more guns than you and also if you score a single three four or five inch shell hit on let's say an enemy sub hunter or destroyer that's annoying if it scores a similar shell hit on you as a sub you probably ain't diving anymore and then you're dead <laughs> so basically there was no re real reason seen officially to have a deck gun forward and if you did come across something so hopelessly small as to be not worth a torpedo, well, at that point, it didn't matter which end your gun was at because you could just manoeuvre to point it at whatever helpless vessel you'd come across. However, most US subs could mount the gun forward or aft. The mounting points and strengthened positions were there. And so it was down to a certain degree to captain's discretion and so that's why you would see especially on things like gato class uh, or gato class whatever it, i've had half of america tell me it's gato half say it's gato you know you know what i'm talking about which subclass anyway they um decided that some captains decided that you know they wanted to chase after vulnerable merchant ships and small craft so they would have the gun changed to be forward or they'd find a second gun that they could stick on forward or whatever and other captains decided to keep the gun aft for defensive purposes there was a slight advantage in having the gun aft from a general perspective which is of course that as the sub moves through the water while it's underwater the aft mounted gun would be in what was already turbulent water as a result of the submarine's conning tower or sail um, 
and therefore would have a relatively minimal effect on the hydrodynamics of the sub, whereas a forward-mounted gun would be the first thing that broke up the water and caused turbulence, and then turbulent, partly turbulent, partly smooth water would hit the sail. And thus, overall, a forward-mounted gun would cause slightly greater drag and thus an overall slight reduction in speed as compared to an aft-mounted one. Ash the Lego Guy asks, How effective were airdropped mines in comparison to conventionally laid mines? It's kind of a swings and roundabouts thing. So the average German parachute dropped air mine, or airdropped parachute mine, I guess, was carrying a considerably more powerful charge than the average German mine that was deployed from submarines or by surface ships. Now, that could vary. There were a few surface and submarine deployed mines that had charges that were of a similar size, but broadly speaking, the average German ship-carried mine was a smaller device than the airdropped mine. So, therefore, logically, an airdropped mine would do considerably more damage to anything that it hit. Conversely, a mine-laying ship or sub could carry a lot more mines than a single aircraft could, and... Even if you sent out multiple aircraft, a large raid, let's say, that drops a bunch of aerial mines can only really do the same job as a single sub or surface ship could do. And if it's a large surface ship, especially disguised uh, disguised as a merchantman or something, it can still carry a lot more mines than any reasonable sized mine dropping raid. So it, it partially explains why the mines were considerably larger for the air, airdrop variety in terms of their explosive charge because you're not going to have as many of them so you want any hit to be a kind of a one and done deal whereas if you're laying an entire minefield from a ship you want to be able to deploy as many mines as can probably cripple your average ship as possible the of course then you have the fact that aircraft even in the face of aerial defences, can usually get into places that surface ships and submarines can't. So even though you can deploy fewer of them, you can deploy them in areas that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get to. So, for example, in the aftermath of D-Day, uh, the Luftwaffe was dropping aerial mines into the Mulberry Harbour areas. There was no way they were ever going to get a mine-laying ship or sub or even an e-boat into there to drop an extensive minefield, but they could just fly over with a bomber or two and chuck some aerial mines in quite easily. Of course, the flip side to that was that if you had any witnesses, as you usually would in those contested areas, they could just watch the mine come down and be like, right, we know roughly where that is, let's send some mine disposal guys to go in. Whereas perhaps in the early part of the war off, say, the eastern British coast, then if they did the dropping operations at night, you might know that they dropped something and it had gone splash, but you wouldn't necessarily know exactly where, with, of course, the commensurate drop in accuracy as to where exactly that had gone as far as where the Germans wanted it to go. So it, it's kind of a swings and roundabouts thing, I think. You can make arguments for or against airdrop mines being more or less effective than the conventionally laid variety. I think certainly in terms of where you could put them, and the effect they would have on a ship that hit them, the airdrop mine was a somewhat more powerful weapon. But the flip side is you are less likely to actually, you know, get uh, to actually hit such a mine because they'd be present in smaller numbers and were somewhat more easy to sweep. Combined with the fact that if things went reasonably well, a mine laying sub or ship would lay its mines and get away. Whereas if you sent a mine-laying bombing operation, you probably weren't getting at least some of those pilots back. Meatwad asks, For the long-range hits or straddles that were made by some ships, were any able to repeat that similar performance during their engagements or have some degree of consistency? Or was there an element of luck involved? And if not, did it take the later improvement of technology to reach the performance we see in modern artillery systems? It's actually relatively difficult because there are relatively few extremely long-range gun engagements overall. So even if you look at the ships like Warspite, Scharnhorst, Massachusetts, Yamato, etc., that demonstrated some degree of accuracy with their guns at considerably longer range than average, 
when you look at them in other gun engagements, if indeed they even had any other gun engagements um, in some cases, then you tend to find that those engagements, the firing starts at much closer ranges because that's usually where they've spotted the enemy or there's some other tactical reason for it. And usually they try and aim to engage at closer ranges anyway because even if you can hit at very long range, the percentage chance is going to be considerably less. So with a given amount of shells on board, it's just more practical to try and shoot people at closer ranges because, well, A, your shells have more penetrative power generally. Um, there's a whole deck versus belt arm, and arg arm arg argument, I guess, there. Um, but, yeah, you're more likely to hit, <laughs> just statistically speaking. So some ships had reputations as being very good gun ships, Um with very good gunners, so you do see, like, say, Warspite does have a consistently fairly good track record with her guns um, in terms of hitting and in terms of, you know, getting a decent hit percentage and being able to engage at relatively long ranges. The, the main problem is that when you look at an engagement like Calabria, which this is the part of the damage to Giulio Cesare, um, or the sinking of glorious or whatever those rate uh, those engagements are happening pretty much at the horizon limit already so <laughs> there's not really a huge amount further you can go unless you get into you know blind firing on the basis of radar or scout plane spots or you have a very very high spotting position on the ship which extends your overall uh, horizon and you're shooting at kind of the top half of a ship that's poking up over set horizon but in the battles where some of these hits took place um, and where there was a prolonged engagement so uh, the ones that have been most heavily documented and analyzed and also have quite a number of salvos fired are obviously in this context calabria and the sinking of glorious and in both cases, when you look, you know, they get a hit or two, but they are consistently straddling at those kinds of ranges. So there is a degree of consistency in them, in either Warspite or Scharnhorst or whoever, having found the range and then pounding the area in that range bracket. And then it's just a matter of, to a degree, luck that you know if you are hitting within say a three to four hundred meter spread throw enough shells into that spread assume the enemy is in the middle of that spread and eventually something will land you hope before something changes which means that that firing solution is no longer valid andrew Waite asks if the king george v had undergone major refits between 1950 and 55 what would they look like well the early 50s is really too early for the Royal Navy to be introducing guided missiles to its ships. So any overhaul, I mean, it depends how much money the government's going to throw at this because Vanguard has an overhaul in this kind of time period. But obviously, as long as well as Royal Yacht conversion duties, etc., there's a relatively small amount of money spent on her. So assuming that the KGVs had a let's say, most economically plausible refit, it would have consisted largely of removing almost all of the small and medium calibre anti-aircraft weapons, i.e. all the 20 and 40 mils, maybe keeping a handful of 40 mils around, but most of that would have gone, and then they would have overhauled her sensor suite, so new radar, etc., etc., um, fire control systems... Uh, communications equipment and th that probably would have been about it like she would have kept her 14 inch guns probably would have kept the 5.25s and the weight saved by removing the 20s and the 40s would have gone into all the other stuff we just described um, maybe also uh, reconfigure the superstructure slightly to make it NBC proof now if you want to go hyper-optimistic and say the government's actually going to make a bunch of funding available and maybe push it towards the end of 1955 period, then, well, again, because you're pre-missile era, etc., then the apart from the stuff I just mentioned, the only other thing that you could realistically say this is this would be an absolute, you know, 
game changer. Obviously, the aircraft facilities would go um, if they hadn't gone already. So the, again, modified superstructure, more electronic equipment, etc. probably going, kind of like with Belfast, going into an area that's built, in newly built into the ship, probably in the area where the aircraft catapult had been. But if you're going to throw lots and lots of money at it, then you might as well take off the 5.25s and replace them with automatic twin 3-inch, at which point you can probably get at least another one in there, um, kind of between where the two high-mounted 5.25s are, where the aircraft catapult uh, rails had been. And given the weight of Auto 3s compared to 5.25 turrets, you could probably find deck space for at least a couple more somewhere around, um, and maybe some kind of helicopter pad stuck somewhere, probably on the stern or something like that. But that's really about all you can do with a King George V if you're doing, even if you're doing a real extensive refit in the early to mid 50s, simply because, well, things like Sea Slug weren't in service yet, which probably for the best, to be honest, overall. Donovan asks, as I've play, been playing World of Warships, I've noticed these large clocks above the bridge of most ships. That has me wondering, what are the clocks for? These are devices known variously as range dials or range clocks or some permutation thereof. And the main way you can tell they're not clocks for timekeeping is, as you can see, they go around 1 to 10, not 1 to 12. The idea of these is kind of a late World War I thought that come, comes fully to fruition in the interwar period, which is that it may be due to smoke um, or specific line of sight issues that a ship in a fleet might not be able to work out what the range is to its target because they can't get a decent visual lock, if you like, on them. Whereas another ship in the line might be able to. And so the purpose of these things is to allow a given ship to tell another ship what the range to its target is. Now, obviously, this only works if you both know which ship you're actually targeting, but <laughs> um, even even if you're targeting different ships, it at least gives you a ballpark figure for where the enemy battle line is, assuming you're shooting at a battle line. And so the idea is that, let's say you are the sixth ship in line, and because of all the gun smoke of the ships ahead of you, you can just about see where an enemy vessel is so you can point your guns at them and get the deflection angle maybe um, but there's too much smoke for you to get a proper focus with your range finder so you don't know exactly what range you're supposed to be shooting at but then you look forward to the fifth ship in line and the fifth ship in line has its dials turned say you can see on this there are two dials so let's say it's got it, it one dial turned to um, one and the other turned to seven. So that tells you that it, it that the enemy ship is at 17,000 yards. And you're like, ah, okay then. Um, or if it's between the seven and the eight, it's 17 and a half thousand yards. Ah, right, okay. So if I aim at this ship and I dial my guns in for 17 and a half thousand yards, assuming we're shooting at the same vessel, which you can obviously communicate by a signal light, um, then my gun should land on target or close to it because i mean obviously you're not if the other ship is shooting at set let's say seventeen and a half thousand you need to work out right well seventeen and a half thousand yards from there i'm a little bit further back so calculate the firing solution given the distance between me and the guy in front of me and that'll give me my actual range that i need to try and shoot at so basically it's to help everybody get more accurate on their shooting in an environment where visual conditions might not be particularly brilliant. Nicholas Rassar asks, Would there be a flagship for convoys, especially the Atlantic convoys? Would you have a destroyer as the flagship if it was only destroyers and smaller vessels? You could actually have potentially as many as three flagships involved in a convoy, believe it or not. So you would have the convoy Commodore's ship, which you could get, I guess you could say, is the flagship for the civilian ships involved right? he is in charge of making sure the merchant ships stay in good order and dealing with most of their concerns 
You would then have the convoy escort commander, who would obviously be in one of the escort ships, which would be a warship, and that was also a flagship, um, just a somewhat different nature. And so normally those would be your two flagships in a convoy, one for the civilian side, one for the uh, military side of things. But as more and more escorts became available, you also had um, ocean escort groups, uh, which also went by various other names. So you would have ships that would accompany the convoy end to end um, on, on the route. But as they entered the Mid-Atlantic, the most dangerous part of their journey, you would also have these deep ocean escort groups, which would be separate groups of escorting warships. And they would then join a convoy, pick it, uh, picking it up, escorting it, then breaking off and either heading back to resupply or head off to escort another convoy through the same area of the Atlantic. And so those were distinct from the ships that were tied to the convoy for the entire duration and of course that group would have also have its own flagship albeit that obviously between the attached convoy escort and this temporarily attached convoy escort they would work out which officer had the seniority and who should be the overall flagship for the military side of the convoy um, whilst they were operating together so to, to avoid uh, confusion and conflicting orders. And yes, that flagship could be a destroyer. It could even be a corvette or a frigate, depending on what was available and where the military uh, element of it had des decided to hoist his flag. F-19A Ghost Rider asks, Regarding the Mark 14 torpedo, do you know if any of the personnel at the Bureau of Ordnance ever faced any sort of repercussions for their repeated denial of frontline reports? And even if they didn't face any military court charges, do you know if association or involvement with the scandal affected any careers? I don't know about the people who were actually in the Bureau of Ordnance at the time when all the reports were coming in. Um, as I've covered partly in the US Navy Pacific Fleet submarine history so far, um, there were some effects. The overall head of Buord wasn't particularly happy about the situation and did start to um, take some action once Admiral Lockwood had made it rather obvious that what his subordinates were doing. Um, but I haven't really tracked the specific career paths of various people who happened to be in the Bureau of Ordnance at the time to be able to tell you. Although, I have, as I have mentioned previously, uh, I think in the latest Pacific Fleet campaign uh, video, Admiral Christie, who was in command of Admiral Lockwood's old command in the Southwest Pacific, and who spent most of the war denying that there had been any problems with the Mark VI Exploder, he, his career basically hit ice as soon as he was recalled from that command, albeit that there were other issues with his command in that area, which also didn't please his superiors. So exactly how much of his career coming to a screaming halt was due to specifically the Mark 14 issues and how much was due to some of the other issues, I guess is something that various historians will have to argue about for quite a while. I suspect that possibly a few of the Bureau of Ordnance personnel may have found their careers um, dead in the water as well. But again, it's not in a field that I've looked into in specific detail. Sir Reginald Lee the Fourth asks, The YouTube channel Big Old Boats recently did a video on the mysterious loss of the Carol A. Deering, the largest wooden schooner ever built, that was wrecked off Cape Hatteras with seemingly no crew aboard. Whilst recounting the events prior to the loss, he mentioned the Deering being sighted by a lightship and apparently being tailed by a mystery steamship that turned away and covered her nameplates upon being hailed. Was it possible that this mystery ship may have been a rare instance of pirates operating in the age of steam? Or would merchant ships of another nation, uh, possibly the Soviet Union, have interest in illegally boarding and potentially capturing foreign vessels in the open seas? I mean, it's possible but the the pirate angle is a little bit of a problem because the ship when it was eventually sighted was completely empty and abandoned and appears to show at least from the reports that are available appears to show signs of having been abandoned in relatively good order even if somewhat in haste which 
are things that are not usually associated with pirates. Um, you know, if pirates came aboard and either killed or took everyone prisoner, then there wouldn't have been signs of orderly abandonment. And also one would think that if it was pirates, they would want to take the ship, which, you know, they obviously didn't because the ship was found adrift and then ran in, uh, ran on to some rocks. So relatively unlikely. Um, there were tensions between the crew which are known on the final voyage so that potentially could have been a factor obviously this steamship that refuses to answer hails and covers its nameplates before turning away is suspicious you know that that's definitely uh something that you'd be raising your eyebrows at however <laughs> the flip side to that is that could have a number of explanations beyond piracy um, it could be, for example, that, yeah, maybe the ship did have nefarious intentions towards uh, the Carol A. Deering, but wasn't responsible for the state that it was in. So, you know, maybe they had chanced upon it and thought, oh, maybe maybe we could um, we could have this ship uh, either for salvage or, as was suggested by some at the time, maybe um, Bolshevik raiders were looking to take ships back to the Soviet Union. So maybe this vessel had had an intention to seize the Deering because they'd found it adrift. But then when they were held, you know, they're like, oh, no, 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 we're not. We're not nicking this ship quietly, sail away and sail away from any controversy. Um, so that That's probably a more likely thing than random steamship pirates, because by the 1920s, most oceanic piracy was being done by people who, as I've mentioned in a couple of other previous videos, would board a ship as fair paying passengers or crew and then just take it over mid-ocean there's another interesting possibility that was raised which is that since the ship was found with distress light set that maybe the ship's crew had abandoned the ship and either then been driven out to sea by storms in their boat in their boats or possibly had even been taken off by another vessel specifically the uh, hewitt is mentioned but then the hewitt which it was a steamship, disappears with all hands shortly thereafter. So, you know, you could construct any number of uh, scenarios in, and there's some claims that the, when the ship was sighted before that, you know, the, the command staff were, had gone or were, had vanished and the crew were milling around aimlessly on the deck. So you, you could construct any number of scenarios out of the little bits and pieces that are available. So, for example, if you wanted to construct a narrative, I'm not saying this is what happened, but if you want to do a narrative that fits the available evidence, you could say that perhaps uh, tensions between the command staff and the crew uh, reached boiling point at some point. Uh, there was an altercation and the captain and first officer were both killed uh, in some manner and then the crew real having realized either by getting involved in a dispute between the captain and the first officer or rising up against them that somehow they'd end up with the only people who knew how to navigate the ship dead um hence they're kind of milling around when they're sighted you know a bit confused as to what to do because they're not entirely sure how to get the ship to anywhere in particular plus of course if they did get the ship anywhere they'd have to answer interesting questions like where have the senior staff gone um at which point later on they decide actually you know let's blow this for a laugh hoist the distress signals um distress signals are seen uh the the hewitt comes alongside and or nearby and you know come on then all right you're in distress off you go um Everyone's like, ah, a ship, right, let, let's join up with them and sail off to parts unknown where no one will can really blame us for what's happened on this ship. So they get in the two boats, they row over to the Hewitt, they join the Hewitt's crew, they leave the abandoned Carol A. Deering sailing along. The Hewitt then vanishes for whatever reason it vanishes for, um, possibly hurricane, possibly cargo malfunction, whatever. They all drown, so no one's ever going to find out what happened to them. And then this other steamer, crewed by unknown parties, spots a drifting but large uh, five-masted vessel and thinks, oh, maybe we should, um, you know, go and have that. And then as it's drifting towards the rocks, 
um then suddenly this light ship starts signaling and they're like oh um yeah maybe maybe we don't want to be associated with this publicly and so they cover their nameplate sail away ship goes on the rocks and the rest is history Eric Knapp asks, modern torpedoes can explode under a ship and sink it by breaking its back. Would a modern torpedo exploding under a wooden ship of the line like HMS Victory break its back? Or would the wooden hull have enough flex to withstand the explosion? This is assuming the torpedo acknowledges the existence of the wooden warship at all. I mean, that last bit's a very good point. Uh, I mean, the ship's anchors and guns are going to be the primary sources of ferrous metal on the ship plus the shot lockers, so... There's going to be a few hundred tons of iron on the ship, and the rest of it's going to be wood and rope and people and so forth. So whether a few hundred tons of rather diffuse ferrous metals are enough to set off the uh, magnetic feature of a modern torpedo detonator, who knows? Um, But if such a thing did happen, then, yeah, I mean... A modern keel-breaking torpedo detonating under a ship like Victory would break its keel and cause significant damage to the ship. I mean, even a first-rate ship of the line is relatively small compared to the targets that uh, it's uh, that the modern torpedo is supposed to go after, and it is a big explosive charge after all. And you've got this big jet of water that comes up as well. Um, A wooden ship of the line might have some small advantage in that, yes, wood can flex a little bit more than metal without permanent deformation. um, And being somewhat shorter, you might end up with the ship kind of almost bodily falling into (laughs) the void that's created rather than being suspended over it, depending on the size of the ship and the size of the warhead and the depth of the detonation. Um, But it's, you know, it's still going to do tremendous damage to the underside of the ship, whatever happens. Now, the only slightly amusing thing that might come out of all of this is that you might end up with an implacable situation. So I may have mentioned this before. If not, then I'll tell you now. You have implacable, formerly Duguay Troyen, I think, um, which is also a Trafalgar veteran, former French vessel captured into Royal Navy service, and in possibly one of the greatest crimes against museum ships was taken out and summarily sunk in the aftermath of World War II in the Channel. However, the funny part out of it is that the people who were in charge of sinking it tried to scuttle it in the same way that you'd scuttle a um, a modern steel vessel, i.e. they put a bunch of explosives in the hold um, and blew holes in the bottom. The only problem was the ballast and all the extra iron weights that they'd put in to make sure the ship sank fell out of the holes in the bottom And then you have basically a giant collection of timber that floated somewhat waterlogged in the in the Solent, forming something of a navigational hazard. So they had to go and break it up piece by piece in the middle of the sea. So with something like Victory, if you got a perfect dead centre hit, it's entirely possible that again you'd end up with all the ballast and the shot from the magazines down below draining out as much as the water comes in. And then having Victory sit very confused, slightly lower in the water. I mean, it'll probably, with the weight of the guns and everything, it'll probably roll over and sink soon thereafter, just from capsizing. But if if all the circumstances are, are right and the, and the stars align and, you know, the crew decide to chuck the cannon over, etc., you might end up with a keel breaker that just results in kind of the top most of the top half of victory sitting rather bemusedly um, low in the water wondering where the bottom half went. Rodney McCoy asks, Drak, what do you know about Operation Hannibal? Is there even much in the way of records left? Well, Operation Hannibal is the evacuation of German civilians and military personnel from the pocket that was basically what we would now call the, the Baltic States and East Prussia which had been cut off by the Soviet advance in 1945. And, well, they did manage to move about one and a quarter million people, which was quite impressive. Um, They had the advantage, as opposed to other evacuations like Dunkirk, of, well, one, there were one and a quarter million plus people who actually needed to be moved, and two, they had large ports, which meant they could utilise large ships. 
Uh, nonetheless, it was a somewhat fraught operation since they were really packing people in. So the Wilhelm Gustloff, um, the largest single maritime disaster to date, was part of Operation Hannibal when she was sunk with around about 10,000 people on board, most of whom died in the sinking. But, horrifying as it might seem, she was not really a unique casualty of this operation. Several other ships with thousands of people aboard were sunk, uh, most of the people aboard being civilians, and most of them dying, because, well, the Baltic is not a particularly hospitable place at the best of times, and, well, when you've overloaded a ship with six, seven, eight thousand people, there's nowhere near enough lifeboats, even if you can get out quickly enough and you haven't been killed by the torpedoes that hit the ship in the first place, etc., etc., etc. And that's just the big casualty events. There were a lot of other smaller ships with quote unquote only a couple of thousand or a few hundred people aboard that were also blown out of the water um, mostly by Soviet submarines and aircraft and the occasional surface ship so yeah not a, exactly a pleasant time all around um, in terms of documentation there is actually a surprising amount of documentation and record records left it happened right towards the end of the war so, you know, there wasn't a huge amount of time for records to be buried, classified or burnt. In fact, you know, the operation was pretty much brought to an end by the fact that the war came to an end in Europe. So, yeah, you've got that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few books and uh, a few papers and various original source documents that survive about it. Uh, but it is one of the areas that doesn't tend to get so much attention partly because of its nature as a mass evacuation rather than a major battle and partly because uh, the loss of the Wilhelm Gustloff which does have a fair bit written about it tends to overshadow everything else which I mean is somewhat horrifying because you know you have ships with four five six seven thousand people going down and taking most of them with them which in and of themselves, in any other circumstance, would be regarded as a colossal tragedy, but are kind of competing for second, third, and fourth place when the Gustloff is just up there with you know, nearly 10,000 people down in one go. Kra F1 asks, What are your thoughts on the Ryan RF1 jet-piston plane? Was it a necessary step for adopting naval jets? A good idea that was a bit too late, or a useless dead end? I mean, in hindsight, the combination prop and jet was a bit of a dead end. But at the time, I think it was it was a good idea at the time because the main problem with operating very early jets off of carriers was that their power didn't ramp up particularly quickly, which was a bit of a problem when you were trying to operate off of the very short decks that were you know well still are aircraft carriers the reason they can operate jets off of carriers these days is one um well they had catapults back then but catapults these days are considerably more powerful and two jets have gotten considerably better at spooling up their power uh, compared to the first gen ones so by combining the more instantaneous power of a nice big radial up front along with the high speed propulsive capabilities of a jet it was thought well you know that'll solve the problem we can get this thing up off the deck and then it's going to have the advantages of the jet power as well but i think ultimately it was probably a little bit of a, a solution that was looking to solve a problem that really had much better solutions i.e getting more capable jets online because i mean it's not exactly like the u.s navy was suffering from a significant technological um disadvantage in the latter part of World War II against its opponents. So it wasn't needed as an emergency stopgap measure. And the one of the big problems with these kinds of hybrids is you do have to introduce a bunch of compromises because there's certain characteristics for aircraft that you ideally put in them to deal with the fact they're basically pusher aircraft, i.e. The, the thrust is coming out the back, i.e. a jet, and a lot of those are rather diametrically opposed to some of the aerodynamic 
considerations that you have to make for an aircraft that's a puller aircraft, i.e. most propeller-driven aircraft. So if you have both, then you end up with this kind of hybrid where neither, neither power plant is actually able to operate at full efficiency. Plus, the fireball itself had a bunch of uh, technical issues as well. So I don't think it was a necessary step for adopting naval jets. I mean, the Royal Navy basically went straight to the sea vampire without trying anything particularly hybrid. And I think the US Navy could equally have gone over to jet power just by giving it a couple of years and being able to therefore go straight onto a jet which could operate as a pure jet fighter rather than this kind of hybrid approach. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was a good idea for the time, but probably an unnecessary one because it it would have been fairly clear, I think, to people that if they'd waited a couple of years, they could have just had a reasonable enough pure jet fighter. Matt Kidd asks, The film Greyhound is set in 1942, and the anti-sub escort is a Fletcher, a tribal, a Polish Grom class, and a Canadian flower. Is this a realistic escort for the period, and could you rank the ASW capabilities of the four ships? Um, yes and no. So, did tribals do convoy escort? Yes. Did the only surviving Grom class, Bliskovica, do convoy escort? Yes. However, um, both of those types tended to do convoy escort in the early desperate years, 39, 40, 41. By 42, Bliskovica was off doing more direct action roles, and the surviving tribals pretty much were as well. Um, well, if they were doing any convoy runs, it was in the Mediterranean. Fletchers, as I've covered in previous Greyhound questions, for the most part oh, were just being hightailed into the Pacific rather than anything else. Uh, Flowers obviously were doing a ton of convoy escorts. So, um, for 1942, an escort group that's made up of a Fletcher, a Tribal, a Grom, and a Flower would, yeah, it's ba it's technic technically for 42, it's not realistic. Um, but if you wanted to have a slightly timeline adjacent film, it's not implausible if you, say, put together a scenario where, for whatever reason, the flower class and subsequent other mass-produced escorts were maybe just not getting into service as quickly as they did historically. Um, the other thing that's also mildly unrealistic about that grouping is, that, as I mentioned in a previous dry dock question, most of the time the escort groups tended to be all from one navy um albeit that you know the polish navy was free polish navy was operating alongside the royal navy the canadians were also operating alongside the royal navy so in and of itself the grouping of a polish canadian and british ship is not unrealistic but having a single u.s ship show up and then be in overall command yeah that, that wouldn't have happened for the most part i mean one you wouldn't have just had a lone u.s ship show up and two if they did even if they did um the larger organizational group probably would have taken over command responsibilities but those are you know relatively speaking you know minor details if you consider it timeline adjacent since of course the only operational grom at this point was bliskovica and they're using a different name for that ship um and you know likewise for pretty much all of the others as well so it's being a slightly fictionalized account you can kind of as say squint and, squint and you'll see something vaguely approximating a a slightly timeline adjacent potential escort now in terms of asw capabilities um it's a little difficult because the most likely, most capable ASW vessel there is actually the Flower Class Corvette because it's a purpose-designed uh, anti-sub escort. So it is going to have um, depth charge projectors, depth charge rails, probably Hedgehog and maybe um, HFDF, ASDIC, Dash Sonar, etc., etc. It's... It's the one that's most likely to have the full works of of anti-sub warfare equipment. 
whereas the Grom tribal and Fletcher, they're all considerably larger, considerably faster, but also substantially less likely to have that full suite of anti-sub equipment. So they'll have depth charge rails, sure, um, possibly K-gun or Y-gun projectors, and probably at least some of them will have ASDIC, but or sonar in the Fletcher's case, but they are less likely to have all of them and in the kind of amounts because basically they've picked the three big fleet destroyers and the crews are also less likely to be experienced in sub hunting whereas that flower class unless it's brand new commissioned almost certainly will know exactly what it's doing um and then in terms of you know between a fletcher a tribal and a grom which makes the best asw ship would largely come down to crews and exactly what equipment they've got aboard. DM Phoenix asks, In the aftermath of the Battle of Santiago de Cuba, there arose a major controversy as to who should be given the greater credit for the American victory. Commodore Schley, whose frontline seamanship and tactical decisions won the day against the Spanish forces, or Admiral Sampson, who whose overall strategic plan and fleet positioning set up the conditions and prerequisites for victory. What's your take on this massive naval feud that proved so divisive amongst the US Navy's officer corp that even the president had to step in? Personally, I look to precedent and use that to determine who should get the overall credit. So, um, if you look at, say, the British assault on Copenhagen, the first one, uh, Admiral Hyde Parker, technically in command of the fleet, but who do we remember as the victor of that battle? Nelson, because Nelson was the one on the front lines actually doing the fighting whilst Hyde Parker stood off and was an observer. Albeit that Hyde Parker was considerably closer to the battle than Sampson was uh, in his armoured cruiser, which had gone off to refuel and have meetings with people. A slightly closer historical incident is, of course, um, the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, now, nowadays, that's remembered as more of a Nelson victory. At the time, the credit was kind of vaguely split between uh, Sir John Jervis and Nelson. Um, Jervis ultimately getting most of the credit. He became Earl St. Vincent as a result. Um, now, partly that's because Nelson was just a captain within the larger fleet. He had no specific command authority to do what he did, even though what he did was mostly... To the reason for the victory being as it was, but also um, Jervis's fleet with Jervis himself got stuck in as once Nelson had slowed them down. And then you look at <clears throat> other similar incidents. So, um, for example, Dogger Bank, that is credited to Beatty, uh, both for the good and ill, despite the fact that the battle cruisers are technically part of the Grand Fleet and therefore you know, Jellicoe is in overall command. So, But Jellicoe is not the admiral who is credited with Dogger Bank. You know, the, the list goes on. Um, you know, Admiral Lee was under, or under the command of senior officers, but Admiral Lee's victory at the, uh, in his fight with Kirishima is credited to Lee, not anyone above him. The loss of Hood and the Battle of Denmark Strait on the British side, Admiral Holland is said to be in command, not Admiral Tovey, despite the fact that Hood and Prince of Wales are part of the home fleet and Tovey has sent them out as part of the home fleet. And the list goes on. Therefore, based on those precedents, my argument would be that Commodore Schley should be the one, I think that's how you pronounce the name anyway, should be the one to get the credit for the Battle of Santiago de Cuba because he was the one who was in operational command at the time that the Spanish fleet came out. He was the one that led the US fleet in the battle. And whilst, yes, Admiral Sampson may have created the blockade, set up the fleet, etc., etc., basically set the table for the fight, he wasn't there. So, sorry, but you don't get credit for a fight you weren't part of <laughs> at least for the most part i know samson showed up late at the end and had a go at a destroyer or two but you know <laughs> details nick brodar asks between 1905 and 1945 
How many times did battleships actually engage other battleships? It depends how strict you want to be with the definition of battleship. Um, if you're going to be absolutely strict and say that the ship has to be considered a full battleship um, by most people, i.e. not a battle cruiser, and that it has actually engaged with an opponent battleship, then I think starting from Tsushima in 1905, you're looking at 14 instances of battleships versus battleships. I've excluded um, the Battle of Cape uh, Cape Spartivento because I don't think Ramillies actually engaged the Italian battleships, even though she was present. Um, and it's possible, uh, I don't know enough of the details, but it's possible that that number may actually go down even further because you have... Um, a couple of instances in the First Balkan War where the Greek Hydra class ironclad battleships were present. I'm not entirely sure if they actually engaged with the Turkish or Ottoman battleships. Uh, Averroff did, but she's an armoured cruiser. If you start to expand it slightly to ships that were being used as battleships or claimed to be used as battleships, um, then you start including things like Washington versus Kirishima, which obviously would put things up. Uh, the action of Lofoten, which was renowned versus the Scharnhorsts. Um, Dogger Bank. I mean, that's a battle cruiser action, so maybe not. Uh, there's a couple of clashes, well, three clashes actually, between Yavuz, ex Goban, and Russian dreadnoughts and pre dreadnoughts in the Baltic. That would put the numbers up as well. And then you get into, you know, the straight up battle cruiser versus battle cruiser clashes like Dogger Bank, which, you know, are, are a whole thing in and of themselves. So if you're going to be absolutely pure about it must be a battleship and it must engage and fight another battleship, then 14 by my definition, um, which obviously means that the con includes the Congos being battle cruisers, but potentially adding half a dozen to a dozen more if you start factoring in as a ships either used as battleships or if you want to take it as big gun armed capital ship actions generally against each other. Andrew Dederer asks, can you come up with an explanation as to why Royal Navy procurement and building is comparatively free of show projects, whilst British aviation policy pre and post World War II seems to be awash with them? For example, R101, the Princess Flying Boat and the Brabazon. If by show projects you effectively kind of mean speculative dash partly or wholly government funded ones, um, that which it kind of follows the whole gamut of the types that you mentioned where they're building a few things only to find there's no real market for them uh, partly it's because aircraft markets move on a lot quicker than warship markets do so you know the princess the saunders road princess flying boat you know probably would have found a market if it wasn't a for world war ii and be the development of long-range jet aircraft so you know at the time that she was conceived there was a market for the princess by the time she was built it had gone um the brabazon probably could have been a success if they'd offered it with a more conventional seating plan as opposed to just you know, a 100 person cabin with fairly luxurious seating basically if you imagine the brabazon flying with I mean, to be honest, the amount of space that was given over to each passenger is actually a little bit larger than what you'd get in a first class cabin today. So if you imagine a an airliner that is purely consists of super first class seating, well, yeah, it might be incredibly luxurious, but um, good luck filling all those seats. <laughs> Um, at the price you'd have to pay for it so yeah the brabs and yeah say if they'd offered it with a slightly more conventional seating plan probably could have been a success r101 fell fell off the weather as did a lot of airships in the interwar period but apart from as i said the, the warship market not really moving on as quickly as the aircraft market i think the other thing is cost because even when you look at something like a brabazon or a princess the amounts of money invested to construct the prototypes and do all the design and development basically have it ready for production 
are maybe a, a third of the cost of a single destroyer of a contemporary time period. And if in the event that you make that the kind of semi-speculative build of an aircraft, you might have uh, military contracts, you might have civilian contracts. There's a fairly wide market potentially for your product, which means it's a slightly safer bet. And even in the event that you don't really get any mass production orders, you might make something back by selling off the prototypes. Whereas if you're going to invest two, three, four times as much money to build a single speculative warship, <laughs> um, you are in a lot more trouble if the Royal Navy doesn't buy it. And uh, given that you're by the time you're talking about post-World War II, you're also entering into the era where people are a lot more proprietary over their technology, you're probably not going to be able to sell it to anyone else. At which point you could you could destroy a company building a speculative warship in the post-World War II period. Plus, of course, if no one wants to buy it, the government isn't exactly going to let a private company keep a heavily armed warship around as a private yacht. <laughs> um, so you really would be up the creek at that point. The year of speculative warship construction kind of ended with the late 19th century. So effectively, that's why there's a lot broader market for somewhat speculatively built aircraft. And it costs a lot less than it does to speculatively or show build a warship. Dr. D.M. Platt asks, did the Royal Navy have a force similar to the Seabees or a device similar to the pontoon block? And what was more important to victory? Pontoon blocks, victory ships, Nissan huts or pierced planking? The Royal Navy did have some equivalents to the pontoon blocks, which they used in the Mulberry Harbours in World War II, um, whale, uh, whales and so forth, that were discussed in the video I actually did on the Mulberry Harbours. But the Royal Navy did not have an equivalent force to the Seabees, and still doesn't, to my uh, knowledge. So um, the US definitely has a one-up on that. So, a, a, you know, ashore construction where needed was usually either done in the British uh, armed forces, either by the army or usually by the uh, Royal Corps of Engineers, or alternatively it would just be whoever catches the short straw of duty if there's enough ships in harbour. Uh, but yeah, no dedicated CB-like unit as far as I'm aware. But in terms of what's more important to victory, um, of the ones you listed, I'd probably say the Victory-Liberty ships, because without them, um, <laughs> all the materials for everything else doesn't get over to the UK to be built into things to be used in the liberation of Europe. Lou Sir asks, I recently saw a picture of a new cruise ship with nine cabin decks above the main deck. You talk often about how upper weight affects stability of warships. How stable are these huge cruise ships? Um, let me put it this way. You won't find me dead on one. Uh, they are notably, and I'm talking about cruise liners specifically here, they are notably less seaworthy, um, less structurally strong, and significantly less stable than <laughs> ships designed to go in all weathers and the open ocean. So, you know, if you want to get some idea of the difference, look at Queen Mary 2. Queen Mary 2 is near enough almost the last of the ocean liners, as distinct from the cruise liners. And although she is also very big, and although she also has a very large superstructure, if you look at a picture of Queen Mary 2 alongside, you know, a cruise liner like this one, you will see some quite considerable differences in how the upper works are constructed. And that's almost entirely for sea keeping and stability reasons, as opposed to these kind of, well, rectangular blocks with slightly pointy ends that <laughs> they put to sea and are, are effectively floating skyscrapers just put on the one side. Now, that's not to say they're completely unsafe, but there's a reason why Queen Mary 2 can guarantee, you know, we will sail that X time and we will arrive at the other side of the ocean with roughly the time that we expected to, even if we run into really bad weather. Whereas cruise liners, 
if the weather gets really bad, those things are heading for the nearest port. <laughs> so, yeah, the only kind of ocean-going or sea-going passenger ship you're ever going to find me in is either a ferry through complete necessity, QM2 if I somehow end up with more money than a minor deity, or possibly one of the Northern Lights cruises or Antarctic cruise ships, again, if I somehow find a stupid amount of money lying around somewhere. Um, and QM2, because she's designed to be an ocean liner, as I said, and the other two because they're designed to sail in the Northern and Southern Oceans in extremely bad sea conditions and possibly with the prospect of pack ice as well. So I don't have too much concern about how they're built i mean you can see some of the videos especially from some of the ships that occupy the antarctic area um, and see what kind of sea states they stand up to those ships are well built um something like this <laughs> um yeah that thing gets caught in a hurricane um i'm first on the lifeboats now to be completely fair to them obviously a lot of this upper works is considerably lighter per volt unit volume as compared to you know gun turrets with 16 18 20 inches thick solid steel armor plate uh, but it does still add up a little bit in the end camino john asks reflecting on hms belfast and her boilers prov providing power to various systems are some of these designed to be secondary uses that can be quickly turned on or off to balance the load Yes, generally speaking, anything that runs off of the main boilers and uses steam pressure to do so should, in theory, be able to be shut down in order to divert that steam power back into the boilers to assist with getting the ship up to speed. Now, obviously, some of the systems that may be directly or indirectly powered by that steam pressure may be needed, especially on a warship, to defend the said ship, if it's even if it does need to you know, book it on out of there. But considerable amounts of systems are not strictly 100% needed. So heating, for example, um, a lot of steam-powered vessels used the, the output of the steam plant to provide heat for the ship's internal systems. You, if you can put up with getting a bit chilly, then they can be shut down and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason there's an image of the Carpathia up is because Carpathia, the ship that rescued most, if not all, of the Titanic survivors, is a fine example of this, and a story I've told a couple of times in the Dry Dock, but the short version is she literally did a real-life version of all power to engines. So as a ocean liner, she had various other systems, including the aforementioned heating, etc., that were all running off of her boilers, but when they got the distress call for Titanic, she raced south and the captain ordered literally anything that uses steam that isn't the engines get shut down. So all power, all steam power was put into the ship's engines and away it went and considerably exceeded its, de its design speed in its efforts to get there. Obviously still wasn't able to get there in time before Titanic sank, but there are probably several hundred people who owe their lives to the captain and passengers' determination to get there at all possible costs. Joao Rita asks, I found an article on the April 1940 issue of Popular Mechanics of an idea for a truly massive 440-foot cargo submarine that could carry 7,500 tons of cargo and 200 passengers. I can see various problems with this, but I know that Germany had some smaller cargo subs in World War I. Did anyone actually make any serious plans for such a craft, at least of these sizes? So, no, there were no real serious plans for something like this. And, well, let's just say the design is a little bit ambitious and plays fast and loose with the facts. So, in the comparison, so the green-backed uh, triangle or square in the top left, it states that... a Typical conventional surface ship is 460 foot long and carries about 7,600 tons of cargo. Well, a Liberty ship is almost 20 foot shorter than that and carries a third again more, at least by design, and can, as World War II showed, carry even more than that. Liberty ship's designed for 10,000 tons on about 440 foot. And as I said, in World War II, you could sometimes find them carrying 12, 13,000 plus tons of cargo. 
So that's an immediate problem with this argument. He's basically made a cargo submarine almost within a two or three feet the length of a Liberty ship that has at least, even if we take his word as read, it has about mm, 60, 50 to 60% of the tr actual cargo capacity of a Liberty vessel. And then you have the fact that if you compare the Deutschlands to conventional cargo ships of their time that are about the same length and displacement, the Deutschlands can just about, if they're being very ambitious, carry about 700 to 800 tonnes of cargo. And a contemporary small freighter is you know booking it at 12 to 1400 tons of cargo so about you know double what a deutschland can um which you know is a significant disadvantage for a cargo sub and well then you have this also we're taking 200 passengers and it has wheels to uh to presumably run along the seabed in some description um, I, I i am questioning this um i mean what you can do you pack them in like sardines i mean you you can see from the orange cross section the these triple cylinders up top are supposed to be where the crew and passengers are um yeah looking through this and that cross section there's very very little allowance for water ballast this thing presumably is going to have to sail fully loaded and it, at that point is going to be barely positively buoyant because the amount of space that's been left in this design for ballast tanks is so minuscule effectively if you sailed with it half empty of cargo you just would not be able to get it to sink Plus, there's you know the the questionable fact of with all these wheels, retractable wheels taking up space, um, that's going to reduce your overall cargo space as well. Um, there are some air bottles that are indicated <laughs> um, in the forward part of the ship, but you I mean a huge section of the bow is taken up with an anchor winch. So yeah, how long this thing can stay underwater with well, presumably about three hundred people on board, if you include the crew. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where the fuel is going to go. I mean, he's got oil stowage down at the bottom, but again, for a ship this size, and, you know, where's the batteries? I mean, again, the batteries are kind of indicated as a bunch of cells just running under the floor at the lowest level, but if you look proportionally at the amount of oil stowage, ballast tanks, batteries, etc., on a 1930s, 40s submarine... This thing has really minimal amounts. And okay, yeah, it's a lot bigger. Square cube law indicates that you might be able to get, you know, a reasonable amount of power in a smaller amount of space. But still, that little space? Uh, um, <laughs> no, this is, I think this is um, a little bit of a flight of fancy too far. Plus, you know, there's, there's this tiny little cargo hatch about the size of two or three men across. So presumably you're only going to be transporting stuff like grain or small, small volume goods. Yeah, I, I don't think this is really a viable thing. You'd probably have to double it in size to get 200 people, seven and a half thousand tons of cargo and something approximating a viable amount of fuel, batteries and ballast in there. And even then I'd be questioning it connor johnson asks two single 18 inch guns on hms furious why well say what you like about courageous and glorious and there are some arguments to be made um, with a reasonable degree of validity that they are designed for things that aren't just sailing into the baltic and shooting things in shallow water but furious very definitely has to be essentially a fast monitor because well two single guns there's no fire control on the planet in world war one that's ever going to give you any kind of accurate firepower against ships so she can't be for taking on enemy capital ships uh, the guns are only 40 caliber now granted yes they're 18 inch guns but 18 inch 40s they're near enough almost at this point the you know 
the modern version of the carronade, um, they're going to rely simply on sheer mass to do their damage rather than, you know, any kind of educated level of um, of ballistics. So, you know, you, you're probably not going to hit anything mobile. And if you did, it's going to have dramatically less armor penetration characteristics than an 18 inch gun should. And between those two, yeah, she, she's basically she's got to be intended to sail into shallow coastal waters and start bombarding things with those 18 inch guns that are on land, because that's the only use you could possibly get out of her at least courageous and glorious with their 15 inches they have four of them so they can get a meaningful salvo off um but i mean there's there's a reason why furious never actually was equipped with both of her 18 inch guns they started turning her into a carrier before she'd even been launched guilty of bias asks several years back i'd visited uss wisconsin and noticed there was an air void between what appears to be the main armor plate and the actual gun house on turret a I'm curious as to what this is. Well, I'm afraid for this one, you're going to have to drop me a line um, and hopefully maybe a photo or two to explain what you mean. Um, because, well, here's Wisconsin's forward turret. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I can't find any air void. Um, I may be misunderstanding what you mean. Uh, do you mean the gap between the uh, lower bit of the armor plate and the deck? Or, or something similar. Um, I I'm, I'm genuinely couldn't tell you at this point because I I can't see an air void myself. And I went through my photos, and admittedly this isn't Wisconsin, this is Iowa, but this is the side view of Iowa's forward gun turret. And again, um, I, I can't see an air void, so I'm afraid uh, my response to this question would be, not sure more information needed? Jim Smitty asks, While the sinking of the ex-SMS Ostfriedsland by Billy Mitchell is fairly well known, I was recently reading about what the British did with their war prizes in 1920. How did it make sense to use reduced charges from the secondary guns of HMS Terror on V-82 at a range of 300 metres, uh, even with the ship heeled over at 12 degrees to simulate long-range plunging fire, it seems the whole process is ripe for bad sets of data. This also happened with V-44, a number of U-boats, Nuremberg, and finally the battleship Barden, although Barden was obviously hit with 15-inch shells. I'm wondering why is this? So the reason for this was basically to allow them to test the effects of shells at long range without actually having to fire them at long range, because the problem is... If you want to see, you know, okay, we expect battle range to be about 15,000 yards for the main fight. Well, if you're going to tow Barden and all these other ships out to 15,000 yards and pelt shells down range at them, um, for one thing, you're going to probably expend a bunch of shells uh, to hit the target at all, and it may not hit where you want to test. And even if eventually, after the expenditure of many expensive new green boy shells, you eventually hit something you actually wanted to, like in this case the frontal armor of the turret you've then got to go all the way down range to see what's going on whereas if you put the gun nice and dead level at 300 yards you can basically call your shots and say i'm going to hit this bit and now i'm going to hit this bit and now i'm going to hit this bit the problem of course is if you fire with full charges then it's completely unrealistic because no one's ever going to come to 300 yards away, you'd hope, uh, and start blasting away at you and you in turn at them. So by using reduced charges, because they knew how how much speed would have been lost by a shell that was fired to, in this case, just over 15,000 yards. So you reduce the charge so that the shell emerges from the gun barrel with about the muzzle velocity that it would have at the other end of the flight if it had been fired with a full charge and then you angle because the shell the gun's being fired pretty much dead level you angle the target ship to simulate the fall because of course at 15,000 yards the shell will be coming down at an angle it won't be flying dead straight which it would be at 300 yards so you calculate well what's the fall of shot going to be right we're going to tilt the ship that much so effectively you've recreated the end state conditions of a shell flying in from 15,000 yards away having been fired with a full charge except you now have laser beam accuracy because you're 
the actual firing is happening at point blank range. So there is method to what they're doing. It, as I say, it's basically a way to simulate fighting at range without the inaccuracies. Although what those results show, frankly, makes the 15 inch gun terrifying. Um, especially for a weapon of its period, let alone, you know, a weapon with the newer shells that it would get by World War II. Because if you look at, uh, you go to, say, the NAV website. Now, admittedly, you know, on NAV website, it specifically says that the World War I figures are f almost certainly for shells at the beginning of the war, the, the sort of the AP shells they went to war with, not the Green Boys. Um, but those figures give a penetration value at about 15,000 yards, of about 12 inches of armor. The problem here is that it's almost but not quite 13 inches, 13.5 or 13.8, something like that, inches of armor on the faceplate of Barden's turret. And even with a simulated angle of drop of, I think, something like 18 degrees, the shell still went through. And of course, the angle of drop increases the effective thickness of the armor to, in this case, well over 14 inches, and the shell still punched through. Um, and the shot at 30 degrees didn't quite make it through. So that indicates that at 50, uh, well, at the muzzle, vol at the velocity of the shell that would be encountered at 15,000 yards, the shell would have to strike this 13 and a point something thick, inch thick of uh, armor at somewhere around 20 to 25 degrees or more in order for it to not penetrate. Now, when you run that, calculate back for um, if it's striking dead on, because it's not just the effective thickness. There's also a whole load of structural issues with hitting at an angle. But basically, if you retro calculate back to the figures that were used in most of the 15 inch armor penetration tables that you'll find in various books and so forth, you'll find that the vast majority of them, whilst they account for muzzle velocity and then the drop-off of muzzle velocity, so the velocity of the shell at a given amount of range, most of them don't account for angle of fall. They just assume a 90 degree oblique impact. So altering the angle of fall down to zero, making the various adjustments, you arrive at that quite frankly terrifying prospect of instead of 12 inch penetration with the old shells, the equivalent penetration calculation for a green boy shell is something like 16 to 17 inches at 15,000 yards, which uh, basically means that at the time the green boy shells were issued, at 15,000 yards, there's not a single plate of armor on any battleship's belt in the world that can stop a green boy. Uh, not by a long shot. <laughs> and I mean, just, you know, taking the the literal values from Barton, um, there's still not much, except for maybe some elements of a Colorado's belt, that's, and that's somewhat questionable because I'm not entirely sure where those figures come from. But anyway, um, you know, pretty much all battleships in the world are vulnerable to the Green Boys. And then, of course, coming through into World War II, uh, they have better shells. <laughs> and... Yeah, see, this is where practical trials can sometimes show up results that completely obviate and invalidate uh, theoretical calculations. So, yeah, the, the, the Barton trials seem to indicate the 15-inch gun, the 15-inch 42, was a rather terrifying weapon, both for its time and possibly even in World War II. Capitano Lorenzo asks... Adalbert Schneider, first artillery officer of Bismarck, was a highly skilled and quite capable artillery officer. That said, what precisely did his job consist of during combat operations, say against Hood? Did Schneider control, direct and target all eight main guns? And conversely, how did Schneider's job during combat differ to that of fourth artillery officer Bernhard Freiherr von Mülheim Reichberg's job during the same combat? So Bismarck had three main fire control directors, which you can see in photos of her once she'd been fully fitted out. And these were on the foretop. Um, so in this picture, you can see right at the top, well, there's a sort of big radar antenna. But directly below that, currently facing, looks like starboard, could be port, you can see this very long cylinder that's currently running fore to aft on the ship. 
that is the primary rangefinder, and between uh, those two big uh, ends of the cylinder, that is the primary fire control director. That's where Schneider was based. Um, just to the right of that in the picture, so just to the right of the little dome, about halfway up the tower, you can see another little box with a pair of smaller little cylindrical ears poking out of it, sat above the, con the conning tower. That is the forward fire control director. And then there is a similar one with a rangefinder that's intermediate between the two, which is aft, um, or just in front of Caesar turret, and that's Mulhein Reisberg's position. So the idea is that, obviously, the uppermost director has the greatest field of view, because it's the highest, and it has the biggest rangefinder. And so from there, Schneider and his crew will take the range and bearing estimates, and then this data will be passed down through the ship to the fire control computer, which will spit out the results, which will then be fed into the turrets, and then um, Schneider, as the primary um, fire control officer, will effectively direct the ship's main battery. If something happens to him, then you've got a control station forward, which you can see in the photo, and a control station aft, which I said was where Milham Reichberg was based. And those two were designed to control the forward and aft turrets. And now if something happened to them, then uh, you can just about see here Bruno turret just to the right of the picture with the little ears sticking out. So most of Bismarck's turrets would be equipped with their own little rangefinders. So if you lost your relevant fire control station and the primary one, then the turret itself, as long as it stayed in action, could use its own rangefinders. Um, so a lot of redundancy. Um, you see similar things built into US battleships. So if you look at the um, foretop of an Iowa or a South Dakota or North Carolina, you'll see a similar eared little fire control tower, um, which is where the equivalent of Schneider would be based in a US battleship and so on and so forth. So yeah, Schneider had the job of directing the entire main battery. Technically speaking, either of the auxiliaries could in a pinch direct the entire main battery. I mean, they're still feeding data down to the main fire control computer and so forth. Um, but yeah, the thing was that Schneider during the Bismarck's final battle, started off directing the entire main battery. Uh, he was then killed because the, the area was hit. And in theory, then, um, fire control should have passed to the forward position, except the forward position, as I said, was on top of the conning tower. And, well, the conning tower had been hit as well. So there wasn't really anyone left alive there either. Um, Anton and Bruno turrets were fairly quickly knocked out of action anyway, but operated very briefly under local control, and uh, that left poor old Mulheim Reichberg with Caesar and Dora turrets to try and engage King George V. So that's what he was doing until his station took a, a winging, clipping shot uh, across its top, which was very lucky for him, because as he says in his memoirs, you know, a foot lower and he'd be dead. And that knocked out his station, and so it was down to Caesar and Dora to fire independently under their own control, using their own rangefinders for a little bit until they too were disabled. So basically, Mulheim Reichberg and Schneider had approximately speaking the same job, which was to provide range bearing, etc., and correction data to the guns under their control. It's that just that Schneider was the chief of the whole thing, and Mulheim Reichberg was basically uh, one of two primary backups. Chief Eyroll asks, following up on the Battle of Flambra Head video, how much of more political or economic damage would there have been if John Paul Jones's squadron had succeeded in destroying or capturing a significant portion of the convoy they attacked? I've read the convoy was coming from the Baltic. Generally, what were the cargoes on the ships of this convoy, and how many of these convoys were there per year in the Age of Sail? The political damage... Um, would have been quite a lot more than the economic damage because uh, politically Jones fighting a somewhat successful action off of the British coast was already relatively explosive, mitigated to an extent by the fact that the convoy itself got to safety and Bonhomme Richard itself was sunk. 
so you know the actual the captains of Countess of Scarborough and Serapis were actually quite widely lauded and applauded for essentially fulfilling their mission against what on paper were uh, quite heavy odds and you know succeeding for the most part uh, indeed if it hadn't been for the uh, lucky grenade drop from Bonhomme Richard it's probable that just Bonhomme Richard would have been outright sunk although whether or not the damaged Serapis could have then held off the alliance is another matter entirely nonetheless um, you know if the either either I mean there's two ways of going about it I suppose Jones beating um, Serapis in a straight up fight faster is unlikely so perhaps Jones engaging Serapis and then at least two of the other ships in his unit going off after the convoy might that might work especially Alliance because she was pretty quick um, the flip side to that is of course that it's entirely possible that Bonhomme Richard might have gone just gone down completely with uh, with no support nonetheless um, if the if the those two let's say two ships from Jones's squadron had gone after the convoy they probably could have captured half a dozen ships um if there were stragglers the part of the problem was you know where they were the uh, ships had basically got most of the way to Scarborough before the first shots had even been fired but if we changed things around and said well maybe Maybe Jones's ships made better speed and intercepted the convoy further north, so the convoy would have to run past the battle to get to Scarborough, and hence, you know, there's a half a dozen or so were taken. Because you've got to remember, you've got to put prize crews on all of these, so there is a finite amount of of ships you can take. Never mind, you know, actually having to catch them. Um, the economic damage of losing half a dozen to a dozen merchant ships is not going to be huge. In the impact of these ships in particular might be disproportionate to the number captured because the Baltic trade mostly returned with iron ore from Sweden um, or processed iron, which, you know, is a thing that Sweden would continue to trade through various wars and ships timbers, which were a huge, huge um, import from the Baltic. Uh, a lot of ships timbers had previously come from the American colonies, but of course, well, Jones was off the British coast because there was this kind of disagreement over who should actually run them, uh, which had somewhat negated trade in timber from the colonies. So, you know, the Baltic was seeing its ascendancy as the one of the Royal Navy's prime suppliers of certain types of ship supplies, including certain timbers. So capturing a bunch of iron and timber, I mean, to be honest, the value of the cargo compared to other cargoes might be relatively financially speaking low but the economic impact on the royal navy would be somewhat outsized again compared to that number of ships however the thing is you've also got to remember that there are thousands upon thousands of merchant ships and with the best will in the world you know a dozen ships out of a single 50 ship convoy to the baltic it's mostly the psychological impact that's going to be the the problem. Um, there were any any number of convoys going to and from the Baltic um, at this point. It varies year year to year and month to month because obviously some parts of the season are non not favourable and others are. But you typically see up, upwards of a half a dozen similar convoys plus others going to and from the Baltic. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things. I mean, you look at the you know French privateers captured several hundred mer British merchantmen around about the same time period, and overall American privateers, both in uh, the War of Independence and in the War of eighteen twelve, would capture quite a few British merchant ships, uh, you know, hundreds. But it it doesn't tend to change the calculations all that much. Um, what would be much more significant would be if the, if um, Jones's squadron remained somewhat intact uh, somehow, if Bonhomme Richard somehow gets really lucky and was able to disrupt sailing all up and down the British East Coast. That would actually be far more economically impactful than any uh, a number of ships they could arbitrarily capture. Of course, at some point, third rates and stuff would show up and they'd have to retreat, but 
Nah, there you go. Sam Signorelli asks, My wife thought she remembered hearing something about vessels designed for rescue operations that were so fast they couldn't be hit, but which were also noisy. Uh, to me, this sounds like a PT type of boat. Did any Navy actually have something like this? Well, about the closest I can think for that would be maybe something like the uh, RAF's uh, high-speed launches. So um, in their final iteration, they were pretty darn quick. They could hit 40 knots. I mean, they had well over 1,500 horsepower in, uh, the, as you can see, not, not exactly the world's largest of vessels. Um, di disp total displacement, including crew, a little frat bit over 13 tons. So, yeah, you've got a um, over 100 horsepower per ton um, power to weight ratio there. So, yeah, those things could shift. Now, the idea of these was, as the, the name suggests, they were stationed along the British coast, mostly along the south coast, and when a report of a pilot going down was received, then these things would race out at high speed, and hopefully they would be able to grab the pilot, or pilots, if it, or crew, if it was a bomber, and then race back into protected waters, before anyone could do much of anything about it. Now, at 40 knots, it's quick. Um, it's not unhittable, but um, there's very little out there that would be able to actually run them down, um, certainly if they had a head start of, of space. And 14, and they're also very, very maneuverable. So, okay, an aircraft, fine. Yes, an aircraft can run them down. Um, but they're agile enough that an aircraft coming in on a strafing run might find it very, very difficult to keep... Uh, the high-speed launch in its sights, and of course, uh, with the relatively narrow operating field of the English Channel, they'd be back under cover um, of friendly shore-based guns pretty quick. Mike Rentner asks, Back in 1983, when I was still a midshipman, we were given a tour of AR-5, the USS Vulcan. I was a bit disappointed the other day to hear you remark the machine shops on capital ships were very limited, and that anything other than simple objects had to be made in a shipyard. Have you ever reviewed the capabilities of a repair ship? The Vulcan had a foundry on board and could rewind the largest of motors. They were proud of their ability to fabricate the largest of parts and kept what seemed like acres of deck space open so that they had room to work on large structures, drive shafts and other massive items. Did the Navy keep any records of what kind of repairs were made by these ships in forward deployed areas rather than being sent back to the shipyard? With thousands of ships in the fleet, it would appear that repair ships would be really important. I don't know if anyone in the US Navy has sat down and collated how many hours of ship time of sorry of shipyard time and on uh, onshore stocks were saved by the repair ships being able to either fix or fabricate something whilst they were out at sea um, as a collective thing. I don't know if anyone's done that. Obviously, each of the repair ships would have kept records of what they'd made and what they'd passed on to other ships and what they'd repaired. So I suppose someone could collate that by looking at the records of the various repair ships in question. Um, so, yeah, repair ships would be really important. And obviously, they have the capability to fabricate considerably larger items because they are effectively floating machine shops, uh, as you said, with foundries and so forth as opposed to the relatively limited space for a machine shop that you find on even the largest capital ship, which has you know other things <laughs> to be concerned about. Um, now, the the two main reasons why I said what I said in the previous questions was, one, people were asking about the warships. Um, and yes, I know the repair ships are commissioned U U.S. Navy vessels. They carry the USS designation, but let's face it, they're not frontline warships. Um, you, and, you know, you're certainly not going to be having one tagging along with a fleet that's in the middle of a, the teeth of a bunch of kamikazes or something something like that, apart from anything they couldn't keep up. Um, but you would find them in kind of second line areas and um, at places like Ulithi and so forth, uh, perhaps with invasion fleets as well, if you're, if you're really lucky. So obviously, yeah, there is an intervening step between our onboard machine shop if you're a frontline warship can't do anything and back to the shipyard which would be to try and find a repair ship but given that even the US Navy only appears to have had mm, around about a couple of dozen 
um, by the end of World War II and then take into account the multiple theatres it's fighting in and the fact these ships themselves will also need some R&R, you're probably looking at maybe around 8 to 10 active repair ships across the planet for the US Navy during World War II in a fleet of thousands upon thousands of ships. So being able to count on enlisting the services of a repair ship to solve your problem, you know, I, I wouldn't count on it. You certainly could if you were lucky enough to come to the right area. Um, but the other thing, I think, is that the kind of major engineering casualties a repair ship's capable of dealing with on a warship are quite often involved in some rather catastrophic events. So, for example... Um, could a repair ship fabricate a new propeller shaft? Possibly. Certainly for a smaller ship, I would think de definitely so. <laughs> the problem comes of, why is that ship seeking a new propeller shaft? Um, if it's, I don't know, brushed a rock and bent its old one or broken it, then sure, repair ship is the place to go. If it's seeking a new propeller shaft because it took a near miss from a bomb or a torpedo and there's a socking great hole in the side as well, uh, well, the repair ship's probably not going to be doing that. Although that is why you have floating dry docks, I suppose, um, being brought forward. But, you know, in those cases, a lot of the time, those kind of major repairs would necessitate going back to the shipyards anyway. Um, but there is this happy inter intermediate um, point where, you know, if... You've broken something particularly large, but you broke it, or the enemy was kind enough to break it in a rather specific manner that didn't involve catastrophic damage to your hull, then, yeah, a repair ship could definitely, definitely help you out, uh, as well as general maintenance on large things that were close to, to blowing out. So please don't think I'm meaning to uh, ignore the effects of repair ships, but they, they, are, they are very useful, but they are not universally capable of fixing all ills. I think is what I'm trying to get at. Ed Schaller asks, It seems like many battles in the age of iron and steam are determined not by the sinking of a ship, but rather decapitation of command by a hit to the bridge or superstructure. What planning and contingencies were put in place to preserve some sort of command structure to at least be able to surrender instead of sinking, or possibly even to keep fighting? Or, in other words, what's the naval equivalent of the Star Trek adage to not put all your ranking officers in one shuttlecraft? Alternatively, what was there to keep a crack gunnery ship like USS Washington under Lee from just targeting the opposing fleet's bridges instead of trying to sink them? So one way of helping with the situation was to distribute the ship's senior staff throughout the ship. So, for example, at the Battle of Jutland, Warspite's second lieutenant, or second officer, depending on how you want to do uh, call him, was in B turret, whilst obviously the command staff were, the captain was up on the bridge. And, well, as much as the Royal Navy seemed to have a loathing for conning towers, it was a useful place to stick the first officer. <laughs> um, you know, the captain's up on the bridge, first officer in the conning tower, second officer somewhere else, maybe in a gun turret. And that way, um, if one of them was hit, then at least two of the others should in theory be alive and can come and take over uh, some and it, it varies sometimes you'd find the captain and the first officer on the bridge and the second officer would be somewhere else and so on and so forth and obviously you would work your way th uh, through the the list of command staff and different people with different specializations would be available in different areas um, so for example in the in the bulk of the question um, you mentioned Bismarck as some uh, ship that had its command decapitated. And yes, that was somewhat unfortunate for them because obviously they lost Luchens and Lindemann uh, very early on. And then Schneider, who we've mentioned earlier in this dry dock, he was actually um, fourth in line <laughs> of command, if you include Luchens, uh, because the first officer was Earls. Um, but then the next one in rank was the first artillery officer, which was Schneider. Um, but Schneider was dead pretty soon. Earls was down in the forward damage control station, so he was actually fairly well protected um, until at least that started filling up with smoke and fumes and all sorts of things. And he had to leave, and eventually Earls would also die um, when he came up above decks and was uh, trying to corral the men as they were trying to leave the ship, and then that area was hit by a big shell as well. Um, 
but you know so you can see with the germans they had a slightly different way of running things of one who who was in the chain of command and be where they were positioned but uh yeah so the the, the solution is simply to distribute all your officers and even for a gunnery ship like washington um, you are not going to be targeting individual portions of the ship. You'll just be counting yourself fortunate to hit the ship. The, the difference between a really crack gunnery ship like Washington under Lee or Warspite or Renown or Scharnhorst is they will score multiple hits, whereas uh, their opponent in the same time will either score no hits or maybe only one or two. So... Um, we, you know, even at 9,000 yards against Kirishima, Washington was happy to score near enough, as makes no difference, a 100% main battery hit ratio. But there was no way they could say this, even at 9,000 yards, that this shell is going in this part of the ship. Now, if you were doing like um, a USS Laffey style suicide run down the side of a battle cruiser, then sure, at that point you can. Um, is specifically target the bridge or whatever but that's kind of the exception to the rule john mccarthy asks i very much enjoyed the video cordite and pudra b um i've been wondering on your thoughts on two potential ways to test the hypothesis that shock was the trigger for explosions at jutland first were there hits on british turrets or barbettes that did not trigger cordite fires or explosions um and even if there were some it's not necessarily conclusive evidence against because I'm sure there are other factors involved, like if the ship was spick and span, etc. And second, it would be interesting to compare the magnitude of the shock required to set off nitroglycerin to that experienced by a nearby hit from a major caliber shell. Again, it's bound to be complicated, but if the numbers differ by many orders of magnitude, then that would raise doubts. So in answer to the first question, yes, a Tiger was hit repeatedly in barbettes and turrets, but uh, didn't suffer explosions. Although interestingly, um, a hit to the barbette of a turret, it was noted, although it did, didn't penetrate, it was noted to have caused significant fumes to appear in the shell and powder rooms until their ventilation systems could clear it, which indicates something was going on somewhere along the line that was generating those fumes, which is a, an interesting data point. Now, Potential ways to test. Well, for one thing, the, the, the slight problem is you'd need permits for cordite and nitroglycerin, which uh, there, there are relatively few people in the UK who um, can get those or have them. At the same time, um, there, there would be ways of testing it. However, you've got to remember that, obviously, well, we're not necessarily talking about pure nitroglycerin. I mean, it would have been pure nitroglycerin crystals at the time that they formed on the um, cartridge cases and as i mentioned in a dry dock answer uh, a little while ago but after the um the video came out there are royal navy documents that actually quite categorically point out because some people are saying oh you know but, um nitroglycerin is liquid at room temp is uh, sorry is liquid at room temperature and wouldn't sweat out of cordite at room temperature well there are multiple Royal Navy cordite handling documents from the time period and afterwards that actually point out that cordite, uh, sorry, nitroglycerin crystals will sweat out of cordite charges at different temp, and it gives different temperature sets for different types of cordite. The oldest type of cordite, which and um, and then the modified cordite that was coming in during World War One having the highest and second highest temperatures where that could take place. And the highest temperatures, which is the oldest types of cordite, correspond approximately to the lowest temperatures you might find in um, magazines, which is quite interesting. Um, but, you know, even once it's come out and scattered around, you might have pure nitroglycerin, either in crystal form or possibly in some kind of liquid form, um, around but as the uh, gunner gunner grant on lion found the dust became highly flammable so you know that would suggest that the nitroglycerin and other products from sweating cordite were i guess integrating themselves um bonding themselves with various 
things that made up dust because we discarded silk fibers we discarded wool fibers all the you know various detritus that makes up dust on a warship and so n now being a mixture of things that's not necessarily going to be subject to the same detonation or burning characteristics as pure nitroglycerin would be and so on and so forth so there it's a fairly complex thing but if i was gonna test it somehow then i think for the you'd probably want to do the test in several stages the first thing would be to create cordite according to the recipes and methods of the uh, at least the first two types of cordite the british used the, the first generation cordite and the cordite that I said they were bringing in in world war one to replace it then store the cordite you've produced in silk bags etc at various temperatures that correspond to the range of temperatures within a battle cruisers magazine and see what happens see if you get any nitroglycerin sweating or what else sweats out from it and then you would probably take samples of that determine what it is exactly and use a combination of the pure if you like cordite sweat plus mix you know find some approximate analogs for the typical makeup of dust that you'd find in a warships turrets and barbettes and handling rooms and mix some of the sweat up with that to create this presumably rather incendiary substance and then all of that could be put in you know a relatively thick metal box and subjected to various tests now you'd you probably have to shoot it with a fairly large gun to simulate the shock effects of you know a shell arriving um, and you've got to remember as well that it's not just the shock effect of the shell arriving the shell might penetrate um, and explode which is obviously going to directly introduce flame and shock even more powerful shockwaves to the equation uh, you might also have a rejected shell that nonetheless dumps some very very hot metal splinters and chunks in which might also set things off. Um, that was certainly a thing. One uh, hit to, I think it was Q turret on Tiger, had one of the turret crew, despite the fact that the shell hadn't managed to penetrate the turret, um, had, getting up rather quickly because he had a very hot shard of metal land in his lap from Spall. So you'd have to test, you know, just impact shock. Um, you'd have to test the effects of hot shards of metal. Uh, from spalling and you'd have to test the effects of an armor piercing round with explosive aboard arriving inside and detonating uh, and see what if anything occurs <laughs> and at what ranges so probably a test that would end up having to be done in the states under con controlled conditions i suspect because well certain certainly in the u.s i think getting access to the relevant chemicals finding someone who's trained in the proper production of them and someone with uh, adequately sized firearms to test it all is probably somewhat easier than it is in the uk dave collier asks can you tell us a bit about the perisher submarine training course is it the hardest training course in the world and why are those who fail the course permanently banned from ser serving on submarines again in any capacity so the second bit first is it the hardest training course in the world it has the reputation of being so um having not taken it myself i don't know uh firsthand but plenty of people have said that it's the case so i'm i'm probably going to take them at their word for that um it's certainly incredibly stressful as we'll find out in a minute um why are those who fail banned from serving on submarines again in any capacity again i don't know for certain but i would suspect it's because these people are competing to become the captains of submarines so they've already done you know an awful lot of other stuff submarine related working their way up the ranks at which point well they presumably by failing the perisher course demonstrated that they don't meet the standards to command a submarine at which point having them as a first officer who might be expected to take command of a submarine would obviously not be necessarily a wise idea the only solutions then would either be to demote them which would lead to a bunch of overqualified people blocking the ranks for for advancement for others or to move them on up and past command of a submarine which obviously you know if they're not fit to command the sub 
seats themselves is not a good idea. So there's not really any place to put them at that point. Um, I.e., if they want to continue in the navy, then and you know they're looking to advance the rank of captain, the only place for them to go at that point is the surface world, I suppose. Uh, that would be my intimation of how it of what I know of it anyway. Now, as far as what the Perisher training course is, um, it was devised actually during World War I, believe it or not, because prior to that, admittedly, the Royal Navy Submarine Service was a relatively young branch at that point, but they had relied on a kind of mentor-to-student approach where experienced submarine captains would train up a first officer and then they would move off onto their own sub and so on and so forth. And to a certain degree, you actually see this still in effect in the US Navy in World War II, uh, where first officers would then be taken off and given their own commands at the conclusion of a number of successful tours. But in the World War I Royal Navy, too many experienced submarine officers were being killed along a lot of the time with their protégés which was leading to a kind of a death spiral of skill in Royal Navy submarine commanders, kind of similar to what happened to the Japanese pilots in World War II. And so to prevent that, the Royal Navy started pulling the some of the best of their um, captains off of the line temporarily and setting up this training school. So prospective candidates for submarine command would could go on this training course which was away from the front lines um get a lot of experience from an experienced captain and then they would presumably the qualifying ones at least would go out to sea with a lot of experience themselves which you know is all to the good now how it works is a four stage course so the first stage and we're talking over the course of months here the first stage, you're on shore and using a variety of simulators and paper exercises and learning directly from the experienced officer who's running like this particular course, you build up a knowledge of you know how to run a submarine. Then you're taken out to sea in a submarine and you basically put the lessons you've learned into practice in terms of systems and command, etc., etc., um, but you are not commanding the sub fully, at least as far as I understand. You're basically exercising elements of command in a very controlled environment. Um, so you you might be, if you like to use the, the, the phrase, given the con for a little while, but just while the sub is cruising. Um, then it's back ashore and it's more classroom and simulator learning. And now it's much more focused on tactics and capabilities of the sub. Um, and this is one of the things um, that with the Perisher course is that the Perisher course is designed to look for leaders as much as it is for tacticians, because you've got to lead the men. And as long as uh, if you can lead the men effectively, then any tactics you put into place are going to work a lot, lot better than trying to put those same tactics in if you have the communication skills of a brick. And then... Stage four, once you've completed your second round of classroom le and simulator learning, is back out to sea. And now you'll be put on a real, live, active submarine, <laughs> given command, albeit with kind of like you know, with if you're learning to drive, where the driving instructor is sitting next to you with a duplicate set of controls. Obviously, the experienced sub captain will be able to take over command when, if necessary, if something's about to go catastrophically wrong and is still recoverable but nonetheless you're given command of an actual full-on submarine so recently for example perisher uh, classes were done on hms artful so you know here is command of a real live fully working fully crewed fully manned operational astute class submarine and then they start throwing scenarios at you thick and fast you don't get much rest between them um, and you have to execute these simulated attacks and evasions, etc., etc., um, successfully. You, if you fail something, it's not necessarily an automatic fail. So it's not like you know, if you are doing your driving test, and I don't know, you go the wrong way down a one-way road. That's an automatic fail in a driving test, whereas in a, uh, let's see, in a, in a submarine assessment, if you are, let's say, 
if they've arranged escape and evasion training. So let's say they've, they've brought a Virginia class over in cooperation with the US Navy, and the Virginia class's uh, task is to hunt you down, and you've got to try and not be hunted down. Well, if the Virginia gets a whiff of your trail and starts trying to follow you, that's not necessarily an automatic fail, as long as you recognise what you've done wrong and you manage to, say, break contact and evade then you would succeed um but you know they'll be like okay right here's a carrier attack the carrier while its escorts try and detect you okay great whatever happened there as long as you didn't just die horribly um now let's say you've managed to launch your torpedoes at the carrier who cares what actually happens with them but you know its submarine escort is now very angry with you now instead of attacking it's now escape and evade right and now great congratulations you've successfully escaped and evaded now um, there's a really narrow, shallow harbour entrance, but you've got to go and lay some mines in there. So go on, off you chop. <laughs> and one after another, these scenarios come. Some offensive, some defensive, some sneaky, some quite open. And you have to keep going. You can't you know, fatigue, um, getting the too narrow focus, etc., etc. You, you can't do it. You have to, you have to keep taking this full-on full spec submarine through its paces and succeeding uh for the most part and if you do succeed if you if you pull all these things off successfully and bear in mind obviously this very experienced sub officer is going to be making absolutely sure he's he's you know putting the pressure on then at the end of it you might hear congratulations captain at which point you probably go home and sleep for a week Reichsbeer Minister asks, what, in your opinion, are the five worst carrier conversions and how-why have they made it on the list? The laydown of the hull has to be after 1924. Well, by saying the hull has to be laid down after 1924, that actually narrows the window massively because the vast, vast, vast majority of horrific carrier conversions in terms of ineffectiveness were pre-1924. A lot of the conversions that post-date that are effectively escort carriers and the independences, like those two alone. I mean, I know escort carriers come in a variety of flavours, but the allied escort carriers and the independences alone make up 90 plus percent of all other conversions into aircraft carriers. And you know, the independences are pretty good for what they are. Most of the escort carriers are, are pretty decent as well which actually makes it difficult to find five separate designs that are actually truly awful. Um, I managed to find four, but, um, well, let's go through the four. So one of them is uh, Spaviero, the Italian conversion from the liner Augustus. The main reason for this is that, well... They, they took a ship that was pretty darn big. Um, I mean, the Augustus had a, a gross registered tonnage of, 30, of uh, nearly 33,000 tonnes, um, which converting GRT into displacement means it probably displaces even more. So you're talking about a ship that is, displacement-wise at least, roughly on par with a Shikaku, albeit just a fraction, um, a fraction shorter but it's very slow you know 20 knots is like first generation conversion slow and as compared to you know something in her ballpark like a shikaku or an essex which is capable of carrying you know 80 to 100 aircraft um the spaviero was projected to be able to carry maybe just maybe pushing about 50 and probably less which, okay, yeah, conversions are less efficient than full full fat um, carriers, but there's a degree of efficiency here, which, you know, especially when you compare it to a Kila, which was also a conversion, but in terms of aircraft per tonne was a much better one. Uh, then, of course, the picture for this particular entry, um, Shinano, obviously, yes, she was carrying, uh, she was converted to be a support carrier, so her air group was considerably smaller than it should have been but that in and of itself is kind of the problem it's like 
a support carrier is something you build if you have plenty of frontline carriers and you know you can afford the luxury of another hull to provide support spares and repairs by the time Shinano was being converted, let alone by the time she was being actually brought into service, carriers were not something the Japanese Navy had a huge number of, nor for that matter were, you know, carrier aircraft pilots. So what's the point of having a ship to support a carrier fleet that you don't have with aircraft you don't have and pilots that you don't have? You might as well just build a nice big heavily armoured carrier and send it to the front lines because it's going to do a slightly more in that role than it ever is you know doling out zeros in ones and twos to your other two remaining carriers um but they didn't they finished it as this bizarre support carrier with a small air wing so that's pretty terrible and then in terms largely based on their stated air groups in terms of efficiency per ton um two uncompleted german projects would have to be uh, the other winners. Uh, one with the proposed conversion of the Admiral Hipper class Seidlitz to a carrier because, well, Seidlitz was going to come in at around something around about 18,000 tons because, you know, the Hippers are a hilariously inefficient heavy cruiser design nonetheless. Um, converting her to a carrier. So you're talking about a displacement that's somewhere in the order of. 60 to 70 percent greater than that of an independence um almost but not quite double that of something like zuiho or shoho and an aircraft capacity that's about half of either of them <laughs> uh, what on earth you know 20 aircraft in a conversion that's 17 18 thousand tons you, you could literally take an independence and a random escort carrier for the same displacement and have, you know, probably about three times the air group. And, and in a similar note, the uh, no, sort of notionally named German aircraft carrier I, which was being converted from the uh, cruise ship or the ocean liner Europa, well, 44,000 tons, almost 300 meters long. You know, this thing's in the ballpark, not quite as long, but in the ballpark of the size of an incomparable carrier conversion with a planned aircraft capacity of, drumroll please, 42. Which is not the answer to life, the universe, and everything in this particular case. You're talking about basically an aircraft carrier who, Shanano aside, um, would not have its displacement rivaled until the midways were constructed. With the air group of a slightly overstuffed independence class, which at this point is one quarter of its displacement and is itself a conversion. I... Yeah, that that is... Um, yeah, not, not brilliant. Not brilliant at all. Trevor Polasek asks, if you could do an around-the-world tour in any one museum ship, which would you choose and why? Now, it depends on a lot of important qualifiers. Um, like, are we talking about museum ships that can still move under their own power? Because that's a very limited uh, batch. Are we talking about museum ships that are still physically afloat? OK, that widens it out a fair bit, but there are still some that are dry docked. Um, or are we just talking about museum ships in general and hand wave the uh, mobility issues? Just assume that they are somehow able to go to sea um, and are fully crewed, or as fully crewed as they need to be to make the journey. Now, assuming the latter most broad category, then there's only one ship I could choose, which would be HMS Victory. Yes, it wouldn't be anywhere near as comfortable. My, my second choice would be an Iowa class, because, you know, bragging rights of showing up in the biggest surviving battleship on the planet. You know, it's definitely a thing. Um, but if it's anything that's going to be magically made ready to go, um, 
it would have to be victory. Yeah, it wouldn't be as comfortable as living on an Iowa. Yes, it wouldn't be anywhere near as fast as living on an Iowa either. But, well, admittedly, if you pull into port on a round-the-world cruise in an Iowa, you are going to get a lot of visitors. But I can guarantee you, if you pull into port in the world's only surviving ship of the line, you're going to get a heck of a lot more. Um, plus, you know, I get the opportunity to do rolling broadsides in salute of every port I go and visit, which, using Victory's guns, one, there's a lot more of them, and two, I won't get lots of expensive repair bills from shattering every single window in a four-mile radius, which is what would happen if I did a rolling broadside from an Iowa in port, I rather suspect. So yeah, uh, that that would be my those would be my two choices depending on whether or not it has to be already afloat or not. Gregory John Murray asks: Apart from proximity fused ammunition, was there ever any study done into advanced ammunition for naval guns in the 1930s and 40s? For example, heat rounds, uh, extended range rounds, or similar. In terms of naval guns, not a huge amount. Most of the specialised stuff that was researched was by the Japanese. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I mean, if you expand it past just basic AP, HE, and anti-aircraft shrapnel shells, you've got the Type 3 um, Sanshiki shell for the Japanese, You've got the underwater shells for the Japanese, which come in two flavours. Diving shells, which weren't unique to the Japanese. The French had some experiments with them as well, um, i.e. shells optimised for underwater trajectories. And the Japanese also had anti-submarine shells, which were a variant on the diving shell that were designed to you know, go under the water and hit the hull of submarines that were at or near the surface. Um, so there's that. I guess the supercharged rounds, to a degree for the British, although that's not really uh, advanced ammunition, that's just packing in a lot more boom behind them. I mean, technically, the super heavy rounds that the US produced for its battleships and some of its uh, larger cruisers are te technically uh, advanced ammunition. And, uh, oh, the French developed rounds that could contain poison gas canisters. That's different. But, yeah, apart from that, not a tremendous amount. I mean, heat rounds, I've explained several times on the dry dock why it's just not practical for uh, naval guns. It, you, you're just poking small holes in the outside, whereas all the vital bits are on quite deep inside and the heat round won't get there. Um, extended range rounds. Extended range rounds were looked at by some elements of some militaries during World War II. Not by the Navy, though. Um, outside of things like, you know, superchargers and so forth, largely on the basis that, well, battleship guns could already shoot well over the horizon anyway. So there was little point in shooting further than you could physically see, even with a radar. <laughs> and, you know, for, for smaller ships, you know, their fire control probably wasn't up to it. And even if it was, you know, taking a six inch round, let's say, and making it effectively like a, a sabo round or something would make such a small round that the effect on the target at the other end would be minimal even if you could hit someone togfather asks every major navy seems to have included torpedoes in their cruiser armament during the interwar period of world and in world war ii except one the u.s navy which appears to have stopped putting torpedoes on their cruisers after the omaha class excluding the atlantis and junos as they're designed as flotilla leaders Given the poor performance of U.S. torpedoes early in the war, using the tonnage for other things was probably for the best, but why did the U.S. navies take such a different approach in the first place? Was it a doctrinal difference in the way they viewed the role of the cruiser, or would including torpedoes have required a compromise elsewhere that they felt was unacceptable? So I actually talked about this with Ryan Szymanski while I was out in Hawaii in September. Uh, link in the time-stamped question for this video, uh, for this timestamped segment of this video in this question in the video description. Um, so I talked about that in a fair degree of detail, both why US battleships and cruisers didn't tend to have um, their have torpedo launchers, but specifically for cruisers and rehashing a little bit of what I said um, at Pearl Harbor, you have a scenario where the US, when it's building these cruisers, it believes it, the cruisers are and battleships as a whole, basically it believes gun ranges are going to be quite high. So it doesn't know about the long lance, um, and if they did, they wouldn't believe it anyway. 
So they're looking at their torpedoes and they're going, right, well, these torpedoes have you know, a few thousand yards pushing up to 10,000-ish yards range, the surface launch ones. Obviously, things will get longer range as time goes on through the interwar period, but nonetheless. And they're expecting their cruisers to be able to engage at 15, 20, 25,000 yards. As it turns out, actually, 20,000 yards is about when cruisers at least open fire, even if the range is closed. And so they're thinking, well... If the cruisers are going to be firing at far beyond the range of torpedoes, why do we need them? Whether they can't physically can't reach out to the ranges the cruisers are going to be fighting at, so it's pointless. And if we take them off, we can save weight and put more guns on. Um, and the guns can help decide the gunfight at these long distances. Also, you've got treaty restrictions, you know, scavenging for weight. So you've, you've, you want your maximum firepower, you want some armour, you want speed what's got to give well these things that you're probably not going to use because you're probably not going to get close to somebody at least in theory yep out they go um plus it's not just about the gun range it's also about the, as you mentioned the doctrine which is that the us sees cruisers primarily as escorts um, now they obviously have the scouting force for a considerable period of time during the interwar period but they're looking at cruisers mainly as Escorts for the battleships, escorts for the carriers, and therefore also a fleet screen, and to a certain extent, a scouting units. But scouting units, as the name suggests, are supposed to be staying at a very long range. So again, torpedoes, not really a factor. And for screening, you want to be able to blow up the enemy as far away as possible. Again, guns are good for this. Um, and if you're screening, you're probably going to be dealing with incoming enemy destroyers, which are going to be fairly hard to target with torpedoes launched from a cruiser. And maybe there'll be a few enemy cruisers around, at which point, again, engagement long range with gunfire. The US doesn't really have the idea of its cruisers running in at closer ranges to torpedo enemy capital ships and other cruisers the way that the Japanese definitely do. And the British are like, well, it probably will happen. So we'll keep them around for just in case purposes. Um, and that, hence, that's why the US basically doesn't equip torpedo launchers. Dave Peachy asks, I've seen a large number of photographs of mainly World War II aircraft carriers with a number of large latticework gantries equally spaced along both sides of the flight deck, HMS Ark Royal being a case in point. These can be seen in both a vertical position, where they look like oversized lifeboat derricks but obviously aren't, and in a horizontal position, which presumably is the position during flight ops. What are these for, and in what positions are they actually being used for their intended purpose? So... These things, as you can see here on Ark Royal, are the support lattices for high-frequency radio aerials, which are then strung between them and quite often don't actually make it into the photos because they're really thin. Um, you can get much, much smaller, less elaborate versions which stick out sometimes, which will be little deck edge um, parks for the tail uh, wheel of aircraft but they're very small compared to these things which are visible in pretty much most photos and as I said you will have from these uh, high frequency radio aerials running along now obviously it's best for those to be up high hence like this so at the moment Ark Royal is not conducting flight ops but if they are conducting flight ops well that's a bit of a problem they are a rather obvious thing to hit and cause a lot of issues and that's why they have the ability to fold out and down uh, 90 degrees so if they're up they're functioning the aircraft carrier is not conducting flight operations if they are down then well they can still technically pick up high frequency transmissions just they're nowhere near as high up so they're not as good at it and the carrier is conducting flight operations or is about to mason k asks or Masonki, I don't know, asks, can you discuss how tough it was to sink the Bismarck as compared to other ships in World War II? Seeing how floating bombs such as Saratoga, Enterprise, Formidable and Hancock survived and often returned to service, it feels like Bismarck's reputation for survivability is overinflated. So, as I've mentioned a few times before, there are two rather distinct elements to taking out a capital ship. There's destroying its ability to fight, at which point it becomes useless as a ship, you know, it was a warship, a ship that cannot fight, even if it's afloat, is just waiting for the inevitable. Um, 
now obviously there's also the destruction of a ship's ability to stay afloat now you don't want to compromise the ability to stay afloat necessarily too much if at all in order to give it the ability to retain its ability to fight but ideally you would like it's it, the ship to be able to fight pretty much to the last gasp with bismarck the divergence between those two is quite significant bismarck for all its size, actually proved relatively easy to knock out of the fight. You know, it was combat ineffective pretty darn quickly, um, even if pounding it with shells proved to take quite a while, and a few torpedoes took quite a while for it to go down. And that's without getting into the whole um, scuttling or not debate. Um, so yeah, Bismarck's armour design did make it relatively tough to put the ship under at point blank range with practically horizontal gunfire um but but you know as i said it was it was long 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 past being a combat effective ship before that however um as i've also pointed out uh, several times before bismarck has the uh, dubious distinction of being one of very very few capital ships designed in such a way that you don't actually have to breach the citadel to sink it you just have to let enough water in elsewhere and that doesn't mean you have to breach every single compartment um, in fact to sink something like bismarck you could shoot up the middle a little bit um, to open up pathways for water and then put a couple of heavy hits into the bow or stern area um, enough to make it go down by the bow or stern at which point progressive flooding would go along above the armor deck above the citadel and just eventually pull the ship down which um with some minor variations is effectively what happened to lutzau in world war one and it also comes down to you don't sink a ship by letting air in the top you sink a ship by letting water in the bottom uh, now granted if you let a lot of air into the top that does make it easier for the ship to sink once you start letting water into the bottom because there'll be a whole bunch of extra holes to uh, flood the ship more quickly once it starts to settle but this is why you know citing the number of shells that were fired at bismarck and the number of shells that um, hit bismarck is somewhat disingenuous when you're looking purely at how difficult it was to sink because every single shell that you know hit a turret um or hit blew up part of the superstructure or the secondary battery or hit above the armor belt for the most part have almost no effect at all on whether or not bismarck is going to sink unless they set off a fire that you know, sets off a magazine or something um because all of that is well above the waterline you know only hits at the waterline fractionally above it or below it which is going to be some shells and well for obvious reasons the torpedoes those are the things that are going to actually you know bring the ship down and the number of shell hits on or below the waterline or near it and and or torpedo hits is considerably fewer than the number of hits that completely wrecked the upper works now the thing is that going into action bismarck obviously had a lot of problems including the fact that she was wallowing with a list so you know regardless of the steerage issue she had clearly taken on some water um, a fairly considerable amount of it before the battle now i think this is where the whole scuttling thing comes into question and people start arguing about it because if you discount the shells that didn't compromise Bismarck's watertight integrity because they were too high above and therefore only contribute to the sinking once you've actually started putting holes underneath her, then you're basically looking at causes for flooding. What, Prince of Wales is hit to the bow? Maybe some flooding caused by a swordfish torpedo or two, although a lot of Bismarck fanboys would have you believe that only the one to the rudder did any real damage so okay fair, fair enough it, if you take that as red then okay then bismarck only has a bit of water in the bow from prince of wales ostensibly there were no hits overnight from the destroyers as well but then that leaves you with one hit shell hit from prince of wales maybe half a dozen from rodney king george v and dorsetshire combined uh norfolk that you know hit at or near the waterline or with a couple of penetrations from uh, rodney and king george v plus a single torpedo from rodney 
as being the main causes for it sinking, which isn't a huge amount of damage to put into a ship to make it go down, to be perfectly honest. Um, obviously, Dorset should put torpedoes into her um, at the end, but at that point, the ship was already in the process of quite clearly commencing its final dive, so how much effect that had of just accelerating something that was already happening over the course of a few minutes is you know difficult to ascertain so yeah and i suppose this is the thing it's it depends on how you look at things because in theory one heavyweight torpedo from rodney um one from a swordfish a diving shell a sort of a shell from prince of wales and a handful of shells from the british ships at the uh, in the final battle that's not a particularly impressive amount to actually put down a German battleship, which is, I suppose, one of the reasons why people are attracted to the scuttling theory. The flip side then being, of course, well, if some of those other torpedoes from the swordfish did more damage than some people want to admit, and or maybe um, there were additional shell hits below the waterline, or maybe the tor maybe the destroyers landed a hit or two, um overnight then add any combination of those to what happened to bismarck on the day of her final battle and suddenly that begins to look a bit more acceptable as to why she sank without needing to needing an explanation of scuttling charges or you can just say well if you believe that the evidence shows that she was scuttled then you say well she was scuttled and that's why she sank so uh, as i said before i'm not i'm not convinced um with the scuttling thing but i don't want to uh, go into it in huge detail on the channel until I can present it in a much more coherent and laid out fashion because of course it will be it, it's a controversial thing to say one way or the other whether or not you believe in the scuttling theory so best to have the evidence on side first um, yeah that's that's basically it depends on what kind of underwater damage you actually think Bismarck had and how well she stood up to it of course you know once she started going down all that that's when all the shells that hit her above start to have a function because then loads of water will pour in and finish it off but you know something's got to explain why she was listing to port and wallowing already on the opening day of the battle and um you know for the people who say that only the hit to the stern did any damage they've got a lot of explaining to do where the rest of the water came from and with that on to part two